Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for your patience. Sorry about my tardiness. Sometimes things just happen. The best laid out plans is always subjected to adjustments, which we will hear from today's conversation if our best laid out plans need adjustment. So good morning again. I'm New York City Councilman Mandy King. I represent the 12th District, Chair of the Juvenile Justice Committee, and I want to thank everyone for coming out and joining us today um, to be a part of today's conversation and making sure that we are prepared for our October 1st deadline of raising the age implementation here in the city of New York. Joined today by committee members, council members Holden, as well as council member Powers and Lanceman. First off, I want to say on behalf of the council, I'd like to extend my condolences to the Department of Corrections and the family of Correctional Officer Jonathan Narian, who was senselessly murdered last week while traveling to his position to work on Rikers Island. I understand that members of the DOC staff are attending the officer's funeral this morning, and we do appreciate the officer um, for all the work he's done, as well as the department for sending representatives today for today's hearing. We are here today to discuss the city's plans of raising the age of criminal responsibility. The council has examined the issue of age of criminal responsibility for many years. Most recently, the Juvenile Justice Committee had a, held a hearing this past April on the topic, and we intend to continue to conduct robust oversight as the city implements a plan to shift custody of 16 and 17 year olds into ACS facilities. As we all know, this is a significant undertaking by the administration, has committed substantial resources and worked the past year to ensure the successful transition of youth off of Rikers Islands by October's first deadline. When the law is fully implemented, we hope there will be significant benefits to the lives of the justice youth that are involved. However, as most of you know, this topic is not without controversy. Advocates, unions, elected officials alike have expressed serious concerns regarding the city's plan to utilize correction officers to provide security regarding the city's plans in our youth facilities during this preliminary transition period of 16 and 17 year olds to ACS custody. At the council, we want to ensure a smooth transition of these youth to ACS custody, but we believe it is essential that the city prioritize the full ACS take over these facilities as soon as possible. It is our responsibility to remain faithful to the spirit of Raise Their Age by ensuring a swift transition to full ACS custody to promote the rehabilitation of impacted youth. I look forward to hearing testimony from the administration regarding their plans for operation of the Horizon Specialized Secure Detention Facility and, measures are being, and what measures are being taken to ensure the punitive culture that often permeates our city jails are not replicated in this new facility. Additionally, the Juvenile Justice Committee will also vote on resolution number 283, sponsored by Council Member Powers, calling upon the governor to coordinate a review of cases involving persons convicted of a crime at the age of 16 or 17 of age before raised the age legislation went into effect, who are currently incarcerated or sentenced in criminal court to ensure those sentences were equitably and just. It should not be the case that a young person who encountered the justice system before this law took, an effect, took, took effect or are left to languish in the adult system. The Raise the Age legislation is an acknowledgement that we owe our young people more and that it's a responsibility that, it can, that we can uphold so, so we can, we can up, uphold selectively. I want to thank again Council Members Powers for his leadership on this issue. And as we, before we take the oath, I just want to say to all of us, we are all in here because we have a commitment, we have an interest to make sure that this system is work that works right. The state has imposed an October 1st mandate on us all and we've been the first municipality to have to deliver on this. But I say to all adults in the room, I want us all to continue to be fair, I want us to be honest and be sincere. Whatever our testimony is or whatever our thoughts are, whatever our agendas are, that we do it in the best interest of the children, as I call students, who are looking for us to help them rehabilitate themselves. With that all being said, we are on some time constraints. So I want people to be real concise in their testimony, tell us what they want to share with us, but more importantly, let's make sure if we got to get this right. Again, I do not want to see this car 
move off the lot if the transmission is faulty. I want to make sure that if we do this, we do it right the first time that we're coming back. We got to change the tire. We got to come back, change the transmission. We got to come back and change the oil. If we're going to move this together by October 1st, let's make sure that it's right and it's ready. If it's not right and ready, I'm expecting us to be responsible to have the right conversation so we can get it right the first time, not be bullying into an October 1st mandate if we are not prepared. If we prepared, let's do it. But if we have some challenges, let's be real in the conversation so we can address it correctly. With that being said, I would kind of like to ask the representatives of the administration to please state their name for the record so committee, com committee council can administer the oath. Dana Kaplan, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Felipe Franco, Deputy Commissioner, ACS. Jean-Claude Lebec, uh, Assistant Commissioner for Strategic Initiatives, Department of Correction. And good morning, Jeanine Gray, Deputy Commissioner for New York City, Department of Probation. Okay, before we go to your testimony today, we're going to step back and allow Councilmember Powers to make a statement in um, regards to today's resolution that's up for a vote. Thank okay. you, and I, I appreciate brevity, so I will keep it, I will keep it short. Uh, thank you to the Chair uh, Andy King and the, all the folks here today who represent those working in the correction system and the probation system as well, uh, then the Mayor's office. Um, the bill, the resolution that we're voting on today would call on the Governor to review the cases of anyone in New York who was convicted of a crime at age 16 or 17 before their raise the age law went into effect, who are currently incarcerated or sentenced in criminal court to ensure that those sentences are equitable and just. As we know, in April 2017, the governor signed Raise the Age into Law, which declared that New York will no longer automatically prosecute 16 and 17 year olds as adults by October 2019. Until then, New York and North Carolina were the only states that still sentenced 16 and 17 year olds as adults. However, uh, as noted amongst uh, a number of editorial boards as well, the legislation did not bring any justice for the hundreds of young people who are already behind bars when Raise the Age went into effect. As one of those op-eds put it recently, it's fundamentally unfair. It's like doing a long sentence for a crime even after society has decided it doesn't merit so many years behind bars. Since our goal should be re rehabilitation and not incarceration, and since we need to make sure our criminal justice system is both safe and fair, I believe a review of past cases where young people were charged in criminal court is necessary. I thank the chair for putting us up for a vote, and I do want to second something he said earlier, which is I know many folks couldn't be here today because of the officer that lost his life last week. I share uh, uh, the pain of, of many and, and um, really want to send my, my condolences to the family and to the department and, uh, of course, those who represent the officers as well, who I know are grieving that today and could not be here. So, Dan, thank you for the chair for recognizing that as well. Thank you. Okay, let's go to testimony in today's conversation. Vote first. Uh, oh, you want to vote first? Yeah. I think All right. Since we have quorum, we're going to take the vote on Councilmember Powell's resolution. To the clerk. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote, committee on juvenile justice, resolution 283, Chair King. I vote aye. Levine. I vote aye. Perkins. Aye. Holden. Aye. By vote of four and the affirmative, zero, the negative, and no abstentions. Item has been adopted by the committee. Okay, um, before we start, I just want to say for the record, we've been joined by Council Members Mark Levine and Council Member Bill Perkins. Please. Great, thank you. Good morning, Chair King and members of the Committee on Juvenile Justice. As I said earlier, my name is Dana Kaplan, and I am Deputy Director at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this very important topic today. Uh, as you know, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice advises the Mayor on public safety strategy, and together with our partners inside and outside government, develops and implements policies that promote safety and fairness to reduce unnecessary incarceration. Today's hearing update on the city's uh, implementation of Raise the Age is a major milestone in the larger context of justice reform in our city. In the last four years in New York City, we've seen an acceleration of trends that have defined the public safety landscape over the last three decades and made this the safest big city in the country. While jail and prison populations around the country increased, New York City's jail population has fallen by half since 1990. 
In the last four years, the jail population dropped by 27 percent, giving us the lowest incarceration rate of any big city and the steepest four-year decline in the size of the jail population since 1998. Since 2014, the number of 16 and 17-year-olds in custody in particular has dropped approximately 63 percent, and the number of children in secure juvenile detention has dropped approximately 70 percent, even as our crime rate has continued its downward trend. Meanwhile, last year was the safest year in CompStat history, and low-level enforcement has also reduced dramatically. This is unique and continued proof that jurisdictions can have more safety and safer jails. Mayor de Blasio and the commissioners of our Administration for Children's Services, the New York City Police Department, Department of Correction, Department of Probation, Department of Education, and the Law Department have repeatedly affirmed the city's support for raising the age of criminal responsibility prior to its passage. Additionally, Elizabeth Glazer, the director of my office, participated in the Governor's Commission and was integral in developing the initial proposal for Raise the Age in 2015. We have long been a supporter of treating 16 and 17 year olds more appropriately within the juvenile justice system and applauded the state for its passage of Raise the Age in April of 2017. Since then, the city has been working purposefully to prepare for its implementation, including the removal of all adolescents from Rikers Island by October 1st, 2018, uh, as noted, on a timeline that is shorter than any jurisdiction in New York State. As we testified in April 2018 before this committee, since passage of Raise the Age, the city has been working to prepare for its implementation. We formed interagency working groups focused on court processing, programming and diversion, data analytics and facilities, with participation from the courts, district attorneys, public defenders, and nine city agencies responsible for implementation. We are engaging with our nonprofit partners and providers to pre prepare for implementation and have brought in state and uh, local and national technical assistance providers to assist our efforts. Finally, we have also been meeting regularly with the, la the labor unions representing the affected employees on this implementation effort, specifically to address their concerns. We look forward to a collaborative relationship with the unions in making the implementation of Raise the Age a success. The following updates are in addition to our April 2018 testimony on this topic. So one, as I noted, uh, adolescent population reduction. Since the mayor took office in January 2014, the number of adolescents in custody has fallen by more than 53%, and our ADP has remained under 100 since June of this year. To further these reductions, the city recently invested an additional $8 million in initiatives to divert 16 and 17 year olds from detention where appropriate or to shorten their length of stay in jail. These initiatives in partnership with criminal justice system and service provider partners include expanded supervised release, bail expediting, in-court case processing support, individual case planning resources for young people who are detained, family therapy, and intensive mentoring. Our success in safely reducing the population of young people in detention is a key component of why we are well poised for success in implementation at this point. The Court Processes Working Group, chaired by Judge Edwina Mendelson, has established a set of shared core values to inform the city's implementation of Raise the Age. This group has spearheaded a number of analyses and established protocols that will anchor implementation citywide. The Raise the Age Implementation Task Force has developed a citywide implementation guide describing in detail how each system point and stakeholder will be impacted by the implementation of Raise the Age. The guide has been vetted by the court system, district attorneys, public defenders, and representatives from across the city agencies involved in implementation and reflects a culmination of the city's efforts to enter October 2018 fully prepared. The guide will be publicly released tomorrow and will be made available on the MockJ website. Raise the Age requires the creation of new specialized youth parts in the superior court of each county. Cases for all 13 to 15 year old juvenile offenders and all 16 year old adolescent offenders beginning October 1st, 2018 and 17 year old adolescent offenders beginning October 1st, 2019 will originate in the youth part. Adolescent offenders are uh, 16 or 17 year olds who are charged with a felony offense. Youth part judges and backup judges have been designated in all counties. Additionally, the Office of Court Administration completed a three-week training for judges and an additional convening for youth part judges and their court attorneys. In recognition that Raise the Age may require defense attorneys to represent clients across court jurisdictions in the event that, is a that a case is removed from the youth part to family court, the city supported a specialized training for defense attorneys, defense attorneys who have practiced in the adult system only. 
Legal Aid delivered two half-day CLE training sessions sessions on the basics of juvenile delinquency practice to a range of adult defense practitioners. Finally, New York City Department of Probation Commissioner Anna Bermudez will hold sessions in each borough for prosecutors and defense attorneys to describe the role of probation in the juvenile justice system. In addition to existing alternatives to incarceration, there will be two predisposition alternative to detention program options for young people in the youth part. One, the New York City Department of Probation will make intensive community monitoring available to any young person with a case pending at the direction of the judge and defense bar. The intervention will be modeled on the ICM program currently offered in the family court. MOCJ will expand supervised release to serve more young people. Supervised release services are provided by uh, contracted community-based organizations. The availability of these ATD programs for children whose cases are heard in the youth part will decrease the number of children who are held pretrial in detention, we believe. New after hours processing for juvenile delinquents. Currently, juvenile delinquents arrested after the operating hours of family court are transported directly to detention, likely for an overnight stay. Beginning October 1, 2018, the family court system will expand the hours during which juvenile delinquents can instead be processed in court following arrest. This will increase the number of children who are processed on the same day of arrest, thereby reducing unnecessary overnight stays in detention and contributing to more sp fair and speedy outcomes for children and their families. Practically speaking, this means that juvenile delinquents who cannot be transported to family court by the arresting officer during the court's business hours will be transported by the arresting officer to Manhattan Criminal Court at 100 Center Street, the same location currently used for weekend juvenile pre-petition hearings. Intake and processing of juvenile delinquents at Manhattan Criminal Court will begin at 5, 4 or 5 p.m., seven nights per week. A judge will be available to hear pre-petition hearings if necessary during the din dinner hour beginning at 9 p.m. In terms of facilities, significant renovations have been underway at both Crossroads and Horizon to prepare them to house the significantly expanded number of young people post-raise the age with improvements targeting safety, programming, and administrative face. space. Excuse me. Both facilities will have an operational capacity of 106. We will house all juvenile delinquents, juvenile offenders, and adolescent offenders at Crossroads, which as you know currently holds all of the young people who are currently in the ACS system. ACS will bring on an additional 175 youth development specialists at this facility by October. We will transfer all of the 16 and 17 year olds who are currently held at Rikers uh, to Horizon as well as all newly arrested 17 year olds. The facility will be jointly staffed by DOC and ACS programming staff with a phased transition to all ACS staff which we are aiming to complete within the next year and a half time period through new hiring. The state has denied our request to allow limited interaction between this population and other young people of similar charge severity and age, which, as we've stated in the past, we believe is a policy of segregation that is outside of the spirit of Raise the Age. However, because of our success in continuing to reduce the number of young people in detention, it will not impede our ability to meet the October 1st deadline, and we will submit a new waiver request, request to the state if need be over the course of implementation. Horizon and Cross, Crossroads will both offer the following programming to adolescents. Enrichment programming, vocational training, program counselor-led programming, uh, and access to religious services. At both sites, youth will attend school for a full school day, either working towards a high school diploma or high school equivalency. ACS and DOC have been working diligently to develop one operational set of standards and practices to ensure that the law and spirit of Raise the Age is implemented effectively while adhering to the regulations out, outlined by OCFS and the State Commission of Corrections. The city is very clear on the core value of Raise the Age, that juveniles should be treated as juveniles, and every part of the planning process has been guided by this principle. Finally, tomorrow, on September 21st, the city is holding a conference, Raising the Age for a Fairer New York, which will feature topics such as adolescent brain development, racial and ethnic disparities in juvenile justice, pretrial release and bail, crossover youth, trauma-informed care, and meeting the educa educational needs of justice-involved youth. We will equip, equip practitioners with an understanding of the operational details of how Raise the Age will unfold in New York City and of best practices in juvenile justice and youth development nationwide. 
In closing, New York City has long supported reforms that treat 16 and 17 year olds as juvenile to produce the best possible outcomes for young people, their families, and for public safety. We are well positioned to build on the significant progress that we have made in New York City's juvenile and young adult justice systems to date. Yet our work to ensure the successful implementation of this law will not conclude on October 1st. In appreciation of the required coordination between city agencies, the courts, prosecutors, defense attorneys, community and neighborhood providers, labor, as well as collaboration between the state and local government, the city will lead an ongoing collaborative effort to understand the impact of the law. With the ongoing collaboration of our partners throughout the city, we will realize the goals of Raise the Age and ensure a fair justice system for the children of New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today, again, as I said, on this very important and exciting topic. I will now turn to my colleague, Deputy Commissioner Felipe Franco, who can provide further details on the implementation by ACS in particular, and then I'd be happy to answer all questions. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, Chair King and members of the Committee on Juvenile Justice. I'm Felipe Franco, Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Youth and Family Justice, DYFJ, within the Administration of Children's Services. Thanks for the opportunity to update the committee on the work the city has done to prepare for race the age implementation. We are one of the most monumental juvenile justice reform efforts and we have seen that we have seen in decades. On the race the age, New York State justice system will now acknowledge what research has actually agreed for a significant amount of time that adolescent brain science has shown that treating children as children produce better outcomes for youth justice in both youth. After more than a hundred years, century, of treating 16 and 17 year olds as adults in the criminal justice system, the passage of Raise the Age last year creates an entirely new system for older adolescents that was to be implemented in only 18 months. Unique to New York City, the law also mandates within the same time frame, the transfer of all, of all 16 and 17 year olds currently housed at Rikers Island to a non-Rikers facility to be jointly administered by SCS and the Department of Corrections. Raise the Age is a unique opportunity to build on the tremendous work that has already been done to transform the juvenile justice system in New York City, which has made the city a national leader in juvenile justice reform. The city has done an enormous amount of work over the past year to create this new system for older youth and to establish an infrastructure to support them. I'm pleased to update everyone today on ACS contributions to this massive effort. ACS Division of Youth and Family Justice oversees services and programs for youth at every stage of the human and justice system process. Our continuum includes community-based preventive services and diversion programs for youth who are at risk of delinquency, detention services, youth who are arrested and waiting court resolution, and residential services for adjudicated place youth with New York City, as well as aftercare services upon return to the community. As you know, overall admissions to the juvenile detention system and close to home have decreased significantly year after year. In, and this is due in major part to the intensive preventive services that ACS, the Department of Probation, and our partners provide to help young people from, every, from ever entering into the juvenile justice system. Research overwhelmingly shows that young people do better when they are able to remain at home with their families and with connections to their community. And so we have expanded community a, co a continuum of evidence-based programs, which now also includes interventions that promote permanency for justice-involved youth who do not have a family resource. ACS FAB program, Family Assistance Program, is available to all families of youth up to age 18 um, to help youth avoid delinquency and involvement in the juvenile justice system by providing therapeutic services that address difficult teenage behaviors. ACS also runs the Juvenile Justice Initiative, known as JJI, the largest alternative to place, placement program in the city in partnership with the Department of Probation. JJI serves youth who have been adjudicated in the family court and provides intensive services to these youth to keep them in the communities with their families as part of, uh, with their families. As part of our preparation for Raise the Age, the Division of Youth and Family Justice will be adding new programs to the JJI continuum to help further meet the needs of older youth. 
with substantial input from communities and providers, the Division of Youth and Family Justice issued a request for proposal earlier this year for mentoring and advocacy program known as MAP. MAP is a new community-based program that is designed to support youth by providing them with mentors and advocates with a focus on school engagement, education, and workforce assistance. Contracts awards were announced in July of 2019 and services will begin in November of 2019. The four providers selected for awards have strong community ties and significant community relationships and are located in Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx. We also continue our close collaboration with our partners at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the Department of Probation, the courts, to increase the use of alternative to detention programs, alternative to placement programs, and to keep young people who do not need to be confined safely in the community with the necessary services and support. Uh, ACS has also been working very closely with the Vera Institute of Justice, partner agencies, and national exper experts and advocates on the GERS Task Force to reduce GERS involvement in detention and close to home. The task force work is ongoing and we are currently working on the development of a concept paper for bringing gender-specific programming to the juvenile justice system continuum. Detention. An important part of our continuum is non-secure detention, NSD. It's, it's a smaller, less restrictive residential setting for youth who are remanded by detention by the family courts during the pendency of their court case. Each NSD, non-secure detention residence, houses up to 12 youth and offers young people a supportive family-like environment and close supervision to help accommodate the new 16 and 17 year olds who will be entering the juvenile justice system on the raised the age ACS issued an RFP in the fall of 2017 to increase our existing NSD capacity. Contracts were awarded April 2019, and we now allow, to ex allow us to expand NSD residential care to 131 beds. And secure detention. As you know, ACS currently operates two secure detention facilities, Horizons in the South Bronx and Crossroads in Brooklyn. Under the initial phase of race the age implementation, Crossroads will house juvenile delinquents, juvenile offenders, and the new adolescent offenders, <coughs> and will be primarily staffed by ACS, with DOC, the Department of Correction, serving in an advisory capacity, conducting security audits and recommendations. Horizons will house adult, adult charged 16 and 17 year olds who are currently in Rikers Island, as well as newly arrested 17-year-olds who will continue to be charged as adults until October 1st of 2019. Horizon will be jointly operated by both ACS and DOC. Applications to certify Crossroads as a specialized secure detention facility and Horizons and a specialized juvenile detention facility had been submitted to New York State Office of Children and Family Services and the New York State Commission of Corrections. And we are expecting finalizing this within the coming days. Since the reenactment of Race the Age one short year ago, the city has been working nonstop to ensure that the facilities are safe to serve older youth. Extensive renovations have been ongoing at both sites over the past year. The total budget for the long-term renovations at both facilities is of $329 million, and an authorized budget of $128 million, and already $112 million have been committed to contracts through the Department of Design and Construction to improve on our facilities. As we have mentioned before, the focus has been for October 1st and the renovation of the medical unit and dormitory halls, wall hardening throughout the facility, upgraded program areas and classroom spaces, new plumbing and HVAC systems, updated staff and transport areas, and enhanced security throughout the facility. The work of our frontline staff in detention is, cri is critical to creating positive outcomes in the life of young people that pass through our doors. It's not an easy job. Um, but it's an extremely important one. 
And it's why ACS is proud to have joined SSEU Local 371 and DC 37 in our partner agencies of DCAS, OLR, and OMB to create the new youth development specialist, civil service title for our frontline staff. The YDS replaced the previous juvenile counselor civil service title. Not only does it offers a more appealing salary and a, range, and a range that the previous title did, it better reflects the developmentally appropriate supervision and care we require of our frontline staff and the important role the staff plays in helping youth learn new skills. We are on track, as mentioned by Dana Kaplan, to hire 175 new YDSs by October 1st, which are necessary to meet the staffing ratio required by the state to safely manage youth who will be housed at crossroads. And we have an ongoing campaign to hire more than 400 YDS positions over the next two years. A new class of ACS recruits are hired and training. As new classes of ACS recruits are hired and trained, DOC staff will transition out from their role at Horizons. We are on our way to meeting our hiring goals, but we still need the help of the council and everyone else to identify a pool of committed people in your communities who we want to be, who want to be a force of change in the life of youth. Information about the title and the position has been shared with you today. Essential to operating a safe and effective facility is having a unified program approach and a theory of change that guides all the staff interactions and interventions on behalf of youth. ACS has been working with local and national experts for the last two years, including the Missouri Youth Services Institute and the developers of Safe Crisis Management and the folks at NYU Bellevue to develop a system of care that uses a multidisciplinary team who works together consistently with the same group of youth to reinforce positive behaviors. The multidisciplinary team staff will use a wider range of de-escalation techniques to manage and redirect youth behavior. Essential to the model, success is teaching both youth and staff trauma responsive skills to help youth regulate their emotions and behavior. The vast majority of youth that we serve, as high as 90% of young people in the juvenile justice system, have experienced some sort of trauma. Youth in our secure facilities receive educational, healthcare, mental health services, including psychiatry and psychological care, dental care, recreational activities, and case management on site. Youth in secure detention at attend the New York City Department of Education, District 79 Passages Academy, a full-time educational program that is operated by DOE across our entire juvenile justice system. DOE teachers execute a standard curriculum that includes English, language arts, mathematics, science, social studies, and regions prep, prep, and enables youth to earn credits toward graduation. In addition to the comprehensive educational services provided through Passages Academy, we have worked with the DOE to establish high school equivalency programs in detention and close to home, an alternative for, for some older youth, and have developed new internships, new career certificate programs, and better access to vocational schools. DOE has also invested in educational transitional counselors now available at Horizons and Crossroads to assist youth in the transition back to their community school upon release to the community. Earlier this year, ACS announced that we have entered in a partnership with health and hospitals who will help manage your contracted health care providers currently working at Crossroads and Horizons. This will ensure that young people in detention continue to receive high quality health care and it's also the first step to ensure continuity of care for young people throughout the juvenile justice system from detention to placement and aftercare upon return to their communities. The Division of Youth and Family Justice and the Department of Youth and Community Development collaborate with an extensive array of partners to provide a range of recreational programs and services to justice involved youth in our detention and close to facilities. Through our positive activities and a strong role models, we hope to develop the skills young people need to redirect their life in a positive direction. Uh, in a positive direction, we have vastly expanded our portfolio of programming and services, including our arts and enrichment programs, to better address the interests of all youth in our system, including older adolescents who will be entering the facilities as part of Raise the Age. 
close to home. As you well know, it's a juvenile justice reform that has allowed New York City youth who have been adjudicated as juvenile delinquents to be placed in residential care with ACS near their homes, communities, and also attend the DOE Passages Academy. Close to Home was launched only five years ago, but in that time has dramatically changed the way we approach services and programming for justice-involved youth, and has positioned New York City as the national model for juvenile justice reform. ACS currently partners with seven non-for-profit agencies to deliver strength-based pro programs in 24 non-secure placement NSPs and four limited secure pl placements LSPs, sites located in near located in or near New York City. All of our close-to-home providers have extensive experience in juvenile justice population, and each program offers structured residential care in a smaller, supervised, home-like environment. We estimate the, that court orders directing close-to-home placement in placements will increase with raised the age when it's fully implemented. We're working with our close-to-home providers to maximize existing capacity to accommodate the immediate increases in close-to-home placements on the raised the age and to assess future capacity needs. We intend to fully work with the City Council and all of you on the development of any new close-to-home residential sites if needed. As you know, despite the overwhelming evidence of the success and effectiveness of close to home, and, the expect and, and even with the expected sense of increase on the raised the age, New York State chose to eliminate every dollar of funding for close to home in their 2019 budget. While we're deeply disappointed that the state budget does not continue to share state fiscal responsibility for juvenile justice in New York City and New York City youth, which have always existed previously in every other community, um, we remain committed to the innovative success and to, of close to home. In closing, Race the Age has been a massive undertaking for New York City and across the state, and we are overjoyed by these monumental system reforms that are now finally a reality. We would not have made it to this point without the City Council advocacy, and I am sincerely thank each one of, of you for your supportive voice. The story doesn't end on October 1st. It actually begins. Race the Age implementation will conto continue over the next several years. A 17-year-old transitioned into the juvenile justice system in 2019, October 2019. And the pre-Race the Age population exits our care. We will need the council partnership and support to make sure this enormous system reforms is a success for all youth. We need your advocacy to help restore funding for close to home so that children in New York City will receive the same support from the state that children in any other counties receive. And, need, and we need your voice to help us forge partnership with organizations that can provide the supportive services our young people and families need to thrive. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss the, to discuss the ACS work has done in collaboration with many, many, many of our providers and partner agencies. Um, and our, our sister city agencies in prepare for the race to age implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Thank you to the administration. Thank you all for your testimony today. Um, we are on clock. We have roughly, it's 11 o'clock, and we have roughly to about 12.45 to finish our conversations or whatever that's going to look like. So I'm going to ask people as we continue to testify and ask questions that we're succinct and to the point. Thank you for your testimony. And the good thing about testimonies, everything always sounds great in testimonies until we start dissecting what's real. Um, so I'm, I'm, I want to engage my colleagues in the, in the conversation quick, fast, and hurry. But before I do that, I do just want to ask a couple of quick questions in regards to by October 1st. Um, I'll give you a few questions and you can answer them. How many kids you plan on having off a rank list into the ACS system by October 1st? Secondly, I'd like to know. From the training aspect, you said you're on track to have 175 by October 1st. What happens if something goes wrong with that track and you don't have 175 ready? And I like to know what ready means because I know there's a training piece that has to happen, and because you hired them doesn't mean that they're ready and trained. Second, the third question goes back to our correction officers who have said from day one that they weren't really interested in being part of this transitioning into ACS. 
We understand three days ago the courts have kind of sided with them and saying that, hey, there's a stay right now. So if those 300 bodies get lost, what is your plan to move forward? I'm going to stop right there and let you answer. So I can uh, start just in terms of the numbers. As I said, uh, the average daily population of 16 and 17 year olds on Rikers Island since June has been under 100. Uh, there's 94 young people there today. We anticipate that that will be the, uh, the approximate number that will need to be transferred off by, by October 1st. Uh, in terms of the um, uh, training, I think ACS can speak with that. Uh, the court case that you referenced, we actually uh, were back in court and that uh, temporary re restraining order, order was lifted. And so actually uh, we prevailed on an appeal in that. And so everything is moving uh, full steam ahead in terms of training and our, and our plan, uh, as stated, uh, to have Horizon staffed by DOC and ACS together. And again, DOC and ACS can speak to the specifics of the training and our preparation. I would, Council Member, Member King, I mean, your question is the right one. I mean, when, I'm, when I say 175, what do I mean? I mean that we will have 175 folks by October that we have not just been hired and identified and gone through our extensive vetting process, but also we have actually been through our pre-service academy. One thing that actually we have taken advantage of doing because of Raise the Age is actually look at our pre-service academy, which is about six weeks, and booster the amount of training that actually happened among the teams within the facility. So yes, what I mean by 175 is that actually we will have 175 YDSs that are essential and very, very much needed at crossroads so that we can actually meet the demands of all the Raise the Age kids that as of October 1st will be coming to crossroads. Okay, all right, thank you for that. I'm gonna just, um, after having a number of conversations with unions, I know there's a big concern, and I know that all interested parties are working together to try to make this right. Now, I need to know from correction officers who are coming over, who are gonna be a part of correction officers, I need to know what kind of training have they received as of to date? Are they readily ready to train? And if the and correction officers that who are coming over are these correction officers who have volunteered to be a part of this process as opposed to taking someone out of the jail system who may still, we don't want the, the jail mentality to manifest in our facilities. So if a young brother or young sister who has been locked up with the same individuals now is supposed to be in another facility that's supposed to be a lot, lot less harsher on me and that same face is still there, the same messages still get sent. How are you planning to deal with that? Um, so first on the training, uh, the, the state regulations for DOC and ACS to work at Horizon uh, came along with a number of new regulations. We've had our academy doing trainings every day um, for the last several months to make sure that our officers are up to speed with those new regulations. And um, we're moving, we're, we've finished all of the mandatory trainings that we need to do. Uh, and that is focused on our, our safe crisis management to make sure that we uh, know how to, um, to, to bolster our skills uh, to work with young people and intervene in a very safe way at the new facility. Um, in terms of the number of staff that will be going over there, we'll have 330 uh, correction officers and supervisors combined. Who want to be there? We have a combination of uh, volunteers and also some staff that have specific requirements that the state gave to us um, that, that meet those uh, requirements, and that's two years of working with young people, uh, and those officers have been assigned as well. Over the last couple of months, we've been working with those officers that um, hadn't been, um, that hadn't directly volunteered to engage with them about what to expect over there. Uh, and as we have those conversations, we're getting very good feedback from those staff. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep having more conversations, doing, but I want to give my colleagues an opportunity to jump into the conversation and share their questions or, or their thoughts. So each member, we have about four. We'll do a couple of rounds, depending on how long we can be here, um, four to five minutes to start off. So I'm going to start with Council Member Powers and then Council Member Lansing. Thank you. I'll go quick. Thank you for the testimony and for being here. Um, 
It's going to go quick. So first question is, you had mentioned, Dana, you had mentioned that um, there was a timeline for New York City that was quicker than the rest of the state. Can you tell me what the deadline, the implementation deadlines were for the rest of the, the rest of the state? So the the implementation for the Raise the Age law overall is uh, consistent. So October 1st, 2018 for 16-year-olds, October 1st, 2019 for 17-year-olds. The specific provi provision that is unique to New York City is that all 16 and 17 year olds who are currently uh, in detention must be moved to a juvenile facility that is under the regulations that govern a specialized secure detention facility or the, the SSD facilities. It's a slightly different legal term in terms of what that facility is in New York City. So again, whereas in the rest of the state, it is all newly admitted young people uh, that have to be held in a juvenile facility. In New York City, we have the unique provision that all of the young people must be transferred off. And so that is why, uh, in particular, this you know close to 100 young people that will be moved off of Rikers Island is uh, a, a challenge that we have risen to. I, mean, I think in a very practical term, because I meet with many other commissioners you know, every other week, um, though Commissioner Rocco in Westchester is getting ready for the new race to age kids that are coming in October. He doesn't have to deal with the kids who are coming out of their Valhalla jail. So New York City was imposed something that no one else had to do. Okay, thanks. Um, just because I'm on the clock and we keep going. Uh, we, we're talking a lot about staffing and training. So a follow-up question to the chair. H how does the role of the officer so what, what is the, the role of of a corrections officer in the new facilities how does that differ from their current job in terms of what the duties are going to have to perform so it the duties don't change they're responsible for the direct supervision of the young people at horizon what does change is the partnership with acs and the close collaboration that our staff will have with the program counselors and case managers at acs and so let me just ask a follow-up question. You are replacing at some point the DOC uh, employees, the, the the officers, with ACS staff, which would which would then lend one to believe, lead one to believe that there is a difference because you are hiring ACS employees to do that. Presumably, they're not providing security and safety in there. So it does seem like there is a difference. Yeah, I mean, maybe a way of um, understanding is that. Um, we both, I mean, there's two different type of facilities, the specialist juvenile detention facility that is actually intended to be for young people who have been moved out of Rikers Island, and the specialist secure detention facility, which is for youth who are coming in as part of Race the Age. They're both, and the staff have to abide by the same set of regulations and policies. So policies that are actually publicly available for anyone here to see will dictate the behavior of the YDSs for AOs, and will they take the behavior for correctional officers at Horizons? So if I'm an officer that's not volunteered, and I'm, I meet the two-year requirement, and I'm going to the Horizon or Crossroads, I will be performing straight description of the job as I am today. Yeah. Yes. I mean, No new duties. Uh, no new duties. However, there are certain procedural changes that happen at Horizon. Uh, and so um, there are certain state-specific policies related to movement or mechanical restraints or how uh, you de-escalate certain situations. Uh, and so we have trainings going on with our academy every day to get those officers up to speed. Okay. In and terms of the general responsibility, it's the same. Some yeah. of the specific – there's some, some specific procedures that change. Okay. Um, I was just reading your testimony, and I know I just want to ask a question about it. It says, we are on track to hire 175 YDS staff, which is youth development specialists, right, uh, which are necessary to meet the staffing ratio. And then the next one is, as new classes of ACS recruit, this is about cross, that was, first one is about crossroads, on track to hire 175 new YDS staff. Then it says, as new classes of recruits are hired and trained, DOC will staff will transition out from their role at Horizon. So we kind of go from talking about cro uh, crossroads, but then talking Horizon. Are there, how many YDS, uh, YDS staff will be at Horizon on October 1st? Uh, we're gonna have a very small unit for doing admissions, uh, and we're gonna have a significant cadre of about 80 plus program staff 
But actually, our need is to focus our YDSs to fully staff Crossroads as we meet the demands of the new race the age kids. So the uh, it, we're looking forward, as, as I said in the testimony, to hire really quickly. And as those staff are available and we have a full deployment at Crossroads, we will start deploying staff at Horizons to take over the footprint from the Department of Corrections. So you have 175 new IDS staff at October, uh, sorry, at, at uh, Crossroads on October 1st. And what's the what's the YDS number at Horizon on October first? I think it's a team of twenty five. Twenty five. And how many juvenile? Well, well besides, I think it's important to mention we have twenty five YDSs and we will have eighty seven uh, other staff that are actually supporting the Department of Corrections through programmatic elements. Got it. And how many counselors? I believe the number of counselors is actually fourteen. We also have a cadre of case managers, which is about ten. And there's a significant number of other you know, regressional specialists and other titles that are all supporting the operations at Horizons as of October 1st. Got it. And my last question, how many DOC staff will be at Horizon on October 1st? 330. Got it. So then you're going to have turn those 330 into ACS staff over what period of time? What, what's the timeline? So our, our target is for this to be complete within a year and a half, and as uh, new classes of YDS staff are brought on, uh, there will be a transition off of DOC staff during that time period. Got it. I just will note, I think the ratio is, just seems way off. 330 and then 25 YDS, it strikes me as, uh, yeah, I, mean, I know you guys are working urgently, but um, you know whether it's from, we hear from all different sides of concern about about the staffing and and where we are on that and i think i mean the city council has heard this before we have testified before we at acs in terms of our human and counselor uh, staffing ratios were depleted uh, the title didn't attract the staff that we needed we lost more than 20 percent of the staff within a year so we actually are kind of you bring in the ydss to finally staff crossroads to what is expected under the regulations and to do it safely. We have to be ready not just to serve the juvenile delinquents and juvenile offenders that we have today, but we have to serve all the new kids that are coming in as part of Raise the Age as of October 1st. Okay, I've used my time up, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. You can always come back on next and second round. And thank you. And as you testified to your questions, I did feel a red flag in there when you start talking about the numbers and the time that you're taking the transition, DOC workers, out and getting youth workers in. So I'm just asking us again, I know we have this mandate, but let's make sure that we get it right the first time. Because a Department of Correction officer will come in and will um, 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 implement what he's, he'll always, or she will always go back to what she knows best if they're in a crisis, no matter how much training that you give them. When an ACS worker has a certain amount of training, that will always keep them in that same zone. They come from another culture, so I'm just saying we got to be real mindful on because what I heard is that you're going to have a lot more correctional officers till you get your ACS workers in place. That means what the culture has not changed. You're just taking it from Rikers and placing it in cross Horizon, horizon, which is scary when we're telling our children, our students, that we're putting them in a new and different environment so that we can get them back in society. So we're going to have to keep having this conversation on the date again because I really feel that the October 1st minute, which we are trying to achieve, if we can't get it right, let's figure out how to do it right. Next, I want to ask Council Member Lanceman to share his question. Thanks. Good morning. I just want to understand, on October 1st, between Crossroads and Horizon, how, how many um, ACS staff will there be and how many Department of Corrections staff will there be? Correction officers. At Horizon, on October 1st, we'll have assigned 330 uh, staff, DOC staff to Horizon. That's a combination of correction officers, captains, supervisors, tour Got it. And, and any ACS? Yeah. Uh, as I said before, 87 ACS staff that actually are providing programmatic support, sustaining the facility, counseling, case management on those. So 300-plus to 87. What, what, is there, what is it at um, Crossroad, if any? Crossroad is fully staffed by ACS. Fully staffed ACS. So... You know, I, I'm very unsympathetic to the problems that you're having with properly staffing um, Horizon. The uh, Raise the Age legislation was passed, I think, about 17 months ago. And at the very beginning, issues were raised about whether or not correction officers were the appropriate uh, people to be staffing 
these, uh, these, these, this facility, these facilities to meet the purpose of Raise the Age, which was, as the chair mentioned, as my colleagues mentioned, uh, to get kids, and these are kids that we're talking about, out of correction facilities, facilities out of jails. Now, um, 17 months later, you're telling us that Horizon is going to have d d d four plus times as many correction officers and 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 folks from DOC <clears throat> as people from ACS, <clears throat> and that's just completely unacceptable. Now, I understand that a TRO was issued prohibiting. Um, you from using correction officers, I'm learning now because it wasn't in either of your testimony, it was like the elephant in the room that nobody was talking about, that that TRO was lifted. There's going to be a hearing on October 1st. What happens if uh, the judge who's hearing this on October 1st issues another TRO or some kind of stay prohibiting you from employing uh, uh, correction department employees at um, at this facility, what's what's Plan B? So the the TRO was lifted yesterday. So uh, and you know as you know we have been in court on this many times. Uh, we have prevailed each time, and at this point uh, there is uh, no legal obstacle to us moving ahead fully with our plan. Uh, by October first, we will have the facility staffed and we will have all of the 16 and 17 year olds in the facility and we will continue to go to court as needed but we are going to continue with our path and we believe that it's will this path will lead us forward well listen you may be right and I'm not gonna substitute my legal opinion for yours or wherever you're you're getting that from but if you're wrong and 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 the judge hearing this conducting this hearing has already said has already issued a, a restraining order in this case. It doesn't sound like you have a plan B. And and if you have a plan B, tell me. And if you don't have a plan B, tell me that. Tell me that also. We'll leave the the estimation of whether or not you're going to win this hearing mm -hmm. to what actually happens at at the hearing. Mm -hmm. So I want to know if the hearing goes the wrong way, are these kids still stuck on Rikers Island? So we have uh, continued to face every obstacle in our planning efforts head on and are, you know, obviously constantly evaluating that. But at this point, we are optimistic that we will prevail as we have done in court consistently up into this time period. And we are confident in our path forward. All right. <clears throat> if you could indulge me in just one more question. So um, the, the, the head of the, the Correction Officers Union the administration has done a re remarkable job in, in, in uniting a diverse range of advocates and interests uh, behind the issue of correction officers shouldn't be doing this work. Um, in their testimony later today, I don't know if Mr. Hussein will be here because of the circumstances of one of his members being killed, um, but they've at least submitted written testimony. And in it, it says, the training materials applicable to the horizon reveal that the COs and their supervisors would be required to engage in social development, psychological counseling, education, ego building, and daily life instructions, including combing hair and brushing teeth. These counseling, parenting, et cetera, duties are wholly inconsistent with the job description, training, and experience of correction officers. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, the specific things that you just read are not part of the curriculum that has been uh, given to the correction officers. Okay. Is that a fair description of what their duties will include, whether it's in the curriculum or not? No, uh, they're doing the same thing that they're doing now, direct supervision of the young people. They're not combing hair um, or taking care of those types of hygiene uh, activities that you just read. So, so well, I, I'm not seeing I, the connection. Right, okay. Well, it sounds like what you're saying is, is impossible, and maybe I don't understand something, because the whole premise, or, or at least half the premise of Raise the Age, half the premise of Raise the Age is these kids are not going to be criminally culpable or as culpable as adults. That's one part of the process. But the other part is they're going to be housed and treated, those who are detained, are going to be housed and treated differently than 
individuals in, in adult jails. And so if you're telling me that, in fact, these young people will be treated the same, housed the same, supervised the same, then I don't understand how that, that, that's possible or, or appropriate. There, there has to, it seems to me there has to be a difference between way, the way these young people are being supervised and, and, and um, well, to say supervised, than how adults in Rikers Island are being supervised. There, there has to be a difference. There and will there, be. And if there is a difference, then the responsibilities of the corrections officers coming from Rikers Island have to be different than the responsibilities they will have when they're at, at, at Horizon. So I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues in just a second, but there, there will be far more rigorous programming um, and therapeutic support for the kids at Horizon than they have now. There'll be case managers in the housing areas. There'll be more program counselors available than are available today on Rikers. Um, so I might turn over to my colleagues to explain a little bit about those particularities, but those are things that are, are going to be managed by largely the ACS staff, those changes that you're... And I just uh, wanted to, I guess, emphasize the kind of legal framework of Raise the Age overall, in which Raise the Age created uh, these jointly, uh, this jointly operated facility of Department of Corrections and the Administration for Children's Services and outlined that, uh, you know, did not specify this, you know, specifics of the staffing roles, but that no matter who is staffing these facilities, it has to be mm -hmm. under the regulations that govern the specialized secure detention facilities. And so that is really the, you know, uniqueness of what will happen both at Horizon and also for the adolescent mm -hmm. offenders at Crossroads is that there will be the same set of regulations that are not just SCOC or OCFS, but under this joint uh, new regulatory framework that has been created by Raise the Age. So are you saying that the difference that the young people at these ACS facilities, the difference in their, in their time there, in their experience there, in the way that they are, they are held there, th that will be provided by ACS staff and that the correction officers who, who outnumber the ACF staff exactly. four to one are going to be doing, I don't know, just security, non-touchy-feely stuff? Because that begs another question, but let's do this one first. Yeah, I, I, you know, I cannot talk about the work of the Department of Corrections day to day. What is clear, and, and you, know, you, you have a good you know, statewide perspective, New York City has to have two different type of facilities, specialized juvenile detention facilities and secure, specialized secure detention facilities. <coughs> Crossroads will be the specialized secure detention facility for young people who are coming in as part of raised age. Horizons will be the specialized juvenile detention facility for what the state is calling pre-RTA youth or youth are being removed out of Rikers. Both facilities, no matter if it's a YDS or is actually a correctional officer. Both of them have to abide by the same regulations and the same policies. And actually, policies were are being reviewed and approved by the state. And just to be clear, we, the, those would, regulations we, and policies are different than the ones that have to be adhered to at, at let's say, Rikers Island. Yeah, they're, they have, they're the regulations that have to be used in a specialized juvenile detention facility as approved by OCFS, and they're grounded on juvenile justice right. practices. So, so you can see where we would be concerned where everybody would be concerned that you're taking correction officers trained and used to adhering to regulations at Department of Correction facilities, adult jails, and putting them into um, these, uh, these, these, these youthful offender, these young jails, uh, detention centers. So there, there are a different set of rules, regulations, practices, and what we're hearing from the correction officers is that, aside from whether or not they've been forced to do something that they believe they're not legally re required to do, let's put that aside, they're saying they haven't gotten that training to, mm -hmm. to conduct themselves according to the norms and practices and rules of, of, of an ACS facility. We've had hundreds of staff go through training. Um, so I don't, I, again, I'm sorry, I just don't see that connection. You don't see what connection? The, the, to the point that they don't, they're not getting the training to work at Horizon. 
Well, there's, but they're saying they're not. That's where we, that's where I know, we started. I know, and I'm saying when I see the numbers of staff mm -hmm. in training, um, we've got, we're almost done with it for all the staff that are going there. So, and we will be absolutely done with it by October 1st. So, so, so your last point. So it's your position that every uh, Department of Corrections employee at these facilities by October 1st will have been uh, retrained and received the training necessary to conduct themselves and operate in this environment, which is different from the Rikers Island environment. That's right. Well, we'll hear their view later, but thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Um, and thank you for bringing that up because the staff ratio is a concern. And as someone who's worked in a facility such as um, group homes, it doesn't matter when you're in a situation, you have to be able to deal with the young people who are in there. So God forbid that you have four, 25 correction officers in one location and you have seven ACS workers. When stuff goes down or who needs to do the work, the, AC, the correction officers have to step in because you just don't have the bodies. Can I just make a comment on the radio? Please. So the 87 staff that, and please, please correct me if I get this wrong, th that's a daily number for ACS. Right? Every day there's around 87 staff. The 330 staff that I'm referencing, that's three tours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's not like at any given time there's going to be 300 staff against ACS is 87. You know, our, our highest tour level might be around 112. So it is a relatively equitable distribution of staff on an hourly basis. Just want to make sure that that point is clarified. Yeah. But those 87, they're working around the clock? I mean, they've got to have tours ACS, also. ACS, yeah, right. They're there during business hours. Okay, so for the non-business hours, it will go back to 112 to 15. But, zero. Which is when everybody's sleeping. Yeah. But things have been known to happen in, in these kinds of facilities when people are sleeping. I, you, Thank you, I, Council Member. We'll... Uh, We'll keep following up on this. Um, we're going to take a quick pause to go back to the vote. We've been joined by Councilmember Mark Joni, Council Councilwoman Barron, and is that it? Yeah, Continua so we're going to go open it up back for the vote. Continuation roll call, Reso 283, Committee on Juvenile Justice. Councilmember Barron. I vote aye. Councilmember Joni. Aye. Vote is now currently at six in the affirmative. Okay, we're going to continue. Up next, um, Councilman Holden. Yes, um, I just have a couple of follow-ups to uh, Councilman Lansman. Um, so th the plan B is to win in court. That's what, that's what the plan B is. Um, because I really didn't hear it. <laughs> so we have uh, been to court on this issue several times. We have continued to prevail. Uh, we uh, will be back in court on October 1st. Before then, we will uh, have transferred all of the adolescents, uh, all the 16 and 17 year olds off of Rikers, and we believe we're on track. So, so but that's the plan B, win in court. If you lose in court, what happens? That's what, that's what I think the question was. It, if you lose in court, um, how do you staff Horizon? And so I, uh, don't I think it's premature for me to speculate okay. on what happens after a court hearing that is after we will have already uh, moved the adolescents off of Rikers Island and staff the facility okay can, can um, somebody explain to me why you need the correction officers at Horizon but not at Crossroads in Brooklyn um, again there's two types of facility one of them one of them being the specialized juvenile detention facility that was created by New York State just for New York City for what they are calling the pre-RTA youth, which are the young people who are being moved out of Rikers or are going through the criminal court before race the age. Um, and that facility, we're working in partnership with the Department of Corrections, who actually know these young people to, through the transition. The, horizon, the Crossroads facility will actually be co-manage and with the Department of Corrections where they're actually playing an important role on helping us around safety and security audits and providing technical assistance as we speak. But we have the staff and we actually will have the 175 people that we need to meet all the new 16-year-olds that are coming in in October at Crossroads. But they're both sec secure facilities. They're, well, right? actually, 
to get into the weeds. I mean, Crossroads is actually a secure detention facility and a specialized secure detention facility. Therefore, because there's a new classification of a specialized secure detention facility just to serve adolescent offenders. And those young people will be coming to Crossroads. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to see these facilities, to, to see the difference, because Please. it's really hard to follow some of the... Uh, you know, the, the descriptions here. And, and I think it's important to keep in mind, they, they look very similar. I mean, you know, they, they're intended to look very similar. The Specialized Juvenile Detention, Detention Facility licensing is based on the regulations of the Specialized Secure Detention Facility license. So even though the state created a distinction between the two facilities, they expect the behavior of the staff and the requirements, requirements to be very similar. And, and just to go back, um, some of the training that the correction officers received that are gonna, going to go into um, Horizon. Um, how many hours was that? Uh, and were they, uh, are you, um, you've already recruited the officers, whether willingly, re you know, you recruited them or they volunteered. Um, those have been identified and they have re already received the training? or are they, it's gonna be an ongoing training? For some? A lot of the training's already completed and it's gonna be ongoing. Um, how, many, how many hours uh, have they completed? They're all different hours. So the longest one is um, the safe crisis management training. Uh, that's a four day training, seven hours a day. We have some trainings that are 30 minutes because the change in regulation is so minimal. And we have some trainings that are a full day. Uh, if you would like that breakdown, I, I, can, yeah. I can provide okay, that. Yeah, I would, yes, up. yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, there are a lot of people testifying today. There's been a lot of conversations prior to today. And my question I have to ask is that between the unions, the advocates, the administration, it appears that everyone is not 100% on board. And while we're trying to figure out there are some discrepancies, so the Department of Probation is sitting here in the room. And I want to hear from you. What do you think have been the challenges and do you think with all that everyone's conversations that we can meet these deadlines, but more importantly put a program that's going to be 100% ready to help our, our students that are coming out of Rikers or coming into the system? So good morning again. Um, as far as a DOP is concerned, we are ready for RTA, raise the age October 1st. Um, I would like to say we have already hired additional staff, which is about 100 additional probation officers. Um, the impact will definitely be in juvenile operations, so those probation officers will be there to uh, manage caseloads in all our system points, which is intake, investigations, uh, supervision, our intensive community monitoring that was just spoken about, and what that is clearly is we are get, we're offering that for our young people that are ATD, that's a term to detention, so we can release them in the community with some type of monitoring. This will also be offered to our youth part, adolescent part, young people as well. And what we do there is basically we do daily curfews, uh, daily school visits and home visits. We also have a group session and what we're looking at now to add to our menu of services is credible messengers. And those, of course, are uh, people who are experienced in the justice system and have transformed their lives. And we're hoping and, and looking forward for them to transform the lives of our young people as well. So that is something of additional resource that we will have. As well as that, um, we have been preparing space for RTA. As you know, as the volume and as we move forward, is going to be increased in certain system points in juvenile operations as well. So we have been um, looking for space, preparing space, and we will also have staff in the youth parts as well. So like I said before, to aid those young people and provide them with the services they need, whether it be volunteering services, as well as those young people who are re released ATI, which is all term to incarceration, in which we will use the ICM component in the youth part to service those young people also. I would also like to say, as far as us being prepared, is that we have been working with city agencies, and we also have been on implementation planning efforts to make sure this we are ready. We also have been coordinating, collaborating with uh, OCA, State Office of Administration, New York City Division of Criminal Justice Services, 
Office of Probation and Correctional Office Alternatives, as well as our probation unions. I would also like to state that um, one thing that it's important to know is that in juvenile operations, we do have an opportunity to divert our kids at the front end. And what I mean by that is that based on their suitability and eligibility, and eligibility is based on charges, and suitability is based on all parties agreeing, which includes the complainant witness, the respondent, and the caregiver, which is usually the parent or legal guardian, in which we can service those young people between 20 and 120 days without filing a petition. And what that means is that we can divert these kids from deeper involvement in the juvenile justice system. This was not an opportunity that they had an adult. So we are looking for it uh, to working with our kids in the community, as well as making sure public safety is not jeopardized. We will also have that available after hours. And what that means is we call it night court where we will have offices available to also see the young people and their families and try to divert those cases, as well as we are currently in Crossroads, where we also have an opportunity to divert young people from deeper involvement in the criminal justice system or juvenile justice system. And what is also our collaboration with ACS is that, of course, the families or the caregiver is not in detention or at crossroads. So when that kid is able to go home, ACS has a van that will take the kids home. And this has been working very well. I, lastly, um, some of the things that we will be looking at moving forward, and I know I mentioned it, but also finding more space, working with DCAS to identify more space as we expand. Another thing that we'll be looking at is enhancing all our programming. We will have credible messages, like I mes mentioned, as a group-based mentoring component, um, part of ICM in the youth part as well in family court. We will also increase the capacity of all alternative placement programs, and basically what that means in juvenile operations. Without these programs, our young kids, our young children would have been placed. So we will expand on that, and we will assess the gaps in those pro programs as well as adding individualized mentoring opportunities for those high-risk kids that are not in those programs, that's also something that we will add to our menu. And lastly, uh, preparing for Raise the Age so that we don't forget the victims that are involved, we will also expand our restorative approaches, our circles, and to make sure that our kids are accountable and understand how we can repair the harm. So these are the things that we are doing um, now, and these are the things that we're looking at doing moving forward. But I would like to state again that we are fully support, as well as our Commissioner Anna Bermudez, mm -hmm. of raising the age of criminal responsibility. And we look forward to serving our young people, as well as our families, October 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I'm just going to end with one question. I know you mentioned that you are bringing on more staff. Just want to know, what is your current youth to probation officer ratio right now? And what could it look like as more young people come in after this legislation is implemented? So we have, a, I'll say as quickly as possible, we have a continuum. And what that means is, based on the risks of a young person, is the ratio of our caseload. So I will just give you an example. If we have a young person who is a low risk, our caseloads are a little higher. But when we move up the continuum and we're working with our high risk kids, our caseloads decrease based on the fact that we want to engage these kids. So the ratio can be a probation officer supervising um, young people like one to 15, right? And that's based on the higher the need we want to make sure we can reach those young persons so our caseload decreases. And I think you had another question. And what it will look like once, would those numbers go up? Do you have enough I believe affing? the numbers will go up. They will probably double. But like I said, we have projections for that. So as they double, we will add more probation officers. But we will not decrease or increase that risk as far as the ratios will stay the same, okay. we'll just add officers. All right, and you have the funding to do that? Right now we have the funding and the resources and that's what we're doing right now. So the 100 additional officers, we are prepared 
and especially moving forward to service our young people and their families. Okay. I'm just going to shift gears for a second, and then I'm going to turn it back over to my colleagues. I want to talk a little bit about, about the facilities that you've been working on to improve them and retrofit them for this legislation. Um, where are we with them? Because I know we said we're almost, thank you, we're almost 100%, but we're not at 100%. There was a number of phases as y'all were doing construction. Where are we with the facilities now? I mean, I, I testify about this before. Our focus has been for October 1st to focus on health and safety. And actually, there's set up seven items that we have actually invested um, up to $112 million in contract with the Department of Design and Construction. That includes um, the solidification of all the walls across the facility. That includes the improvement of the living units. I mean, including everything from new beds to new doors to new safety and security systems, improvement in our medical uh, uh, spaces, improvement in our uh, intake and admission spaces, and particular improvement in our classroom and school spaces. So all of those things are actually are, will be in place by October 1st. We, as we have stated before, that's the first phase, and we have done an enormous amount of work to get all of this done substantially by October 1st. We will continue to look at what other programmatic enhancements are needed. Okay, thank thank you for that answer. And one final question is on facilities, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues again who have a question or a statement. Um, we're talking about the bathroom policies at Horizon right now. Now we do understand. Actually, we say we have counselors and we have correction officers, and how does that play out on how? How would your, your request to access to bathrooms in regards to kids when they're in their cells? Um, is it the same person responsible for responding to bathroom requests? Um, is it the same correction officers who, who, who might have to do reports responsible or if they don't let them go? Who's responsible for your bathroom policies? Because that's a big issue in the evening or during the day when children are mm -hmm. you know, in their cells. Sure, so, so how it works. Um, if a young person wants to use the bathroom at night, there um, is a button in their room, and they press that. There's a flashing light. It works. I was there last night. We were testing them out. Um, the officer opens the door. That whole interaction is um, recorded um, both by a tech system uh, that related to the, the button, um, and also, at least in the beginning, we'll safeguard that with a logbook. Um, and we've got pretty strict standards from the Board of Correction to both audit that regularly um, and also report to the Board of Correction on that use. All of that is recorded through our Genentech video system um, back at DOC headquarters. Um, so there's a, a tremendous amount of oversight on ensuring that that's a smooth process. So does that mean the correction officer, uh, matter of fact, let me, is the correction officer going to be considered a correctional officer at these facilities now, or do yes. they take on a new title? Or They're a correction officer. So will they be dressed in correction uniform? or they will, will be. be. So then how do we change the culture if I still see the same correction officer dressed like a police officer when I'm waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning? Yeah. I mean, it's the spirit of raised ages to change that mentality. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you actually alluded, um, council member, to your experience in group homes. And, you know, Langsman, uh, council member Langsman left. Um, there have been multiple moments in the history of New York State, New York City, and the nation where actually practice has changed in juvenile justice and corrections. I mean, that's what we do in our business. I mean, there have been multiple places that actually council member Langsman, when he was in the assembly, and I work in changing the culture of the facilities at OCFS. I mean, training and practice helps people change the way they do the work. It happens in civil service consistently. I'm sure you experience that when you work at ACS. I have no doubt that actually the officers of the Department of Corrections can do what other people have done everywhere else. You, you get trained, you learn how to do things differently, you, you change practice based on science and what has been shown to work, and then you do better. I also don't want to underplay the significant reforms that have happened specifically in the adolescent housing areas on Rikers over the last two years. Uh, there's classrooms that look like classrooms in any other school. We've got a large cadre of officers that are trained in specialized de-escalation skills that come in and are able to prevent incidents and meeting those officers and talking with them and the care that they show for these children and the, and the care that you know, many of them will be going to Horizon, um, it's spectacular. There's weekly meetings with ACS 
with DOE, with the correction officers that are happening now every week to talk about what kinds of interventions kids need to get on a better track. Um, so these are all things that have been happening, happening now and will ensure and help a smoother transition for Raise the Age. So a, a lot of these, uh, I think these practices will be um, very helpful for the transition. Okay, well, we're hoping so. We're still sticking to this October 1st deadline, and it's hoping that this car will be running well. I'd like to turn it over to Councilman Barron right now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to the panel for being here. The last time that we spoke, there was, to me, still not a distinction between SSD and SJD and the requirement. So has that happened, and can you give me clarification as to what exactly it is now? Do you recall what I'm talking about? The, the, the regulation? Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, and if you said it earlier, I apologize. I don't know. <laughs> you didn't. Oh. It's come up. It's, it's a, it is a very complicated topic. Okay. So, uh, there is the, 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 legis the Raise the Age legislation created a New York City specific category right. of a specialized uh, juvenile detention right. facility. Mm -hmm. That is under the same regulations as a specialized secure detention facility. So an SJD, which is specific to the young people coming off of Rikers Island and newly arrested 17-year-olds, is under the exact same regulations as this SSD facility that is for, uh, that has a, a statewide for any adolescent offender. How do they differ? The only distinction is uh, that this specialized juvenile detention facility is for pre-raise the age youth. So young people that haven't come under raise the age from court processes. Those young people cannot be commingled with any other young person. So even if they're under the same facility regulations, uh, they might be the same age, they might be the same charge category, but if uh, one person has been detained pre their raise the, raise the age and another person has been detained post raise the age, they cannot interact in a facility, they cannot be in a classroom together. However, the actual regulations themselves are exactly the same, if that makes sense. Now, it might, and by makes sense. <laughs> so they can be in the same facility? Well, they cannot come into any contact. So if but they were- But can they be in the same facility? So legally, they can be co-located within one facility. Practically and operationally, if you cannot come into any contact in any type of common space or intake or medical services facility, it's not operationally possible for us to have these young people within the same facility. Legally, they say that these two types of facilities can be co-located, but there can be no interaction whatsoever between those different youth. So Crossroads is the SSD mm -hmm. and Horizon is the SJD. Correct. And do you feel that you've given enough training I probably should ask the question of the people who are being trained, so that they can um, meet the purpose of the Vasey Age to talk about those kinds of social programs and social. Yeah. Uh, sure. I mean, like, um, I think I mentioned this before. We have been working for the last two years with a cadre of experts, particularly our staff, in looking at revamping our pre-service offerings in light of the development of, of the new title, the Juvenile Development Specialist. So actually our training now includes more time in the facility within the ecology and understanding the importance of the living units or the milieu as we call it in our work. Um, and yes, I mean actually- How many know, youth development specialists have you trained and hired? Uh, by now we have, we're in the middle of the third class that will get us to 92, I think. And what's your goal? 175. And we actually already made offers on Saturday to 75 more. And they are going through our very extraneous screening process. So you have 72 and you're high offering to 75 more. So you think that you'll be? We will. Where you are. We have another hiring fair this um, week. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, you, Councilman Byrne makes a valid point in regards to we train people. Or are they ready on this day? Because you've gone through the class, may not you might be ready to take the test. It's like studying for the LSAT. You're not yeah. going to take the bar if you ain't ready. So if you're telling us that you've trained all these folks, have you had conversations with evaluations with whoever you're training and say, are you going to be ready to walk into a facility on October 1st? It's the difference then because yeah. you're dealing with human lives now. And if they are, if the adults that you're hiring are not ready, then they will mess up a child who comes in or physically end up getting hurt because they're not ready with proper training. Yeah, exactly what I did actually last week. I, I had the chance to meet the first class of 47. They have been actually in the facility now for three or four weeks. And I actually had the chance to meet with all of them. And I actually just had that question. I mean, how are you doing? Are we doing well enough? What do you need? Um, as you know, in this business, this mentioned that, yes, there's a lot of stuff that we learn in the classroom. There's a lot of things that we're learning now through coaching and peer mentoring. And actually what we have done at ACS is actually we build the capacity of two national consultants through the Missouri Youth Services Institute that are actually embedded in the facility with our staff and some of more senior staff that actually knows how to do our, this work, the former JCs, and they're actually doing that. They're providing coaching and support to the new recruits. I mean, as you know, better than anyone, you don't learn these practices in eight weeks. It takes a significant amount of practice and muscle memory to do it well, and that's what we're focusing on. Okay. Okay. Hold, hold, hold on, hold on. We'll give you an opportunity. Welcome to the party. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good to see you as always. Um, and again, um, and, and I'm going to say this, you know, we are on a time, but I'm going to ask everyone, because we're all here for a purpose. So I'm going to ask, after you testify today, I'm going to ask everyone to stick around and listen to everyone's conversation for the next hour. Because we got to be on, we got to get this right. We can't talk about stuff on the record and then leave not here with the next person and say, then say you know, what? oh, yeah, they're right. We didn't think about that. Oh, yeah. So we can get it right. Because this is our last hearing before October 1st, mm -hmm. unless we have to call an emergency meeting, in which I'm hoping we don't have to do. But we'll do what we got to do to make sure that we save our children's lives. I want to turn it back over to Council Member Barron, who has a follow-up question, then Council Member Powell's after that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In terms of those youth uh, development specialists, what restrictions are there in terms of background checks or background information that exist? What are their restrictions? Are there restrictions that might limit them or prohibit them from being selected? We understand that. We oftentimes look for people who've been through the system and who understand uh, the pitfalls and can relate to the young people and address that issue. But are there any restrictions or are there some circumstances in their past that might prohibit them from being selected? Yeah, I mean, the safety of young people is, you know, the number one priority at ACS. And based on actually... Uh, state and city regulations, there's a very comprehensive vetting very, very process. For example, everyone that actually is going to work as a YDS has to go through the OCFS Statewide Central Register, the ACR. So there actually has to be a thorough review that they don't have a history of child abuse or maltreatment. They also actually have to go through the DCAS Criminal Background Check, the CBC. They also have to go through the New York State Cent Justice Center staff exclusion list. No one that actually is in that list can actually work with young people. They have to go through the New York State jo Justice Center criminal background search on top of the SER. And in addition to all of that, we at ACS have a set of standards such as drug screening, medical screening, fitness screening, PREA candidate compliance affirmation, New York City comprehensive personnel docu document and completion, two character references, past employment verification, and an interview process. So they have to pass all of those all of screening that items. before they get an offer. So in the criminal background check, what might be something, what might be an offense that would prohibit a person from? A, um, a, particularly the Justice Center and the OCFS Central Register pay attention to any offense that has to do of a sexual nature or actually anything related to abusing children or neglecting them. Okay. So those are exclusionary criteria. And um, I was told that there are correction officers who are being asked to complete some type of background information as well, which is not required of others, uh, something new that's being required. Can you talk to that briefly? Yeah, th there's three additional uh, checks that come along with the Raise the Age legislation. 
Um, and there are three that uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Franco just mentioned. The SEL is the state exclusion list. Uh, the SER is a criminal background check. And then there's another justice center uh, check. And who who is required with that? Uh, which uh, titles are required to? Everybody working at Horizon. Are other correction officers required to do those as well? If they're not assigned to Horizon, no. So what was the rationale for uh, including them with this position? It's in the state regulations. It's in the state regs. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Powell. Thank you. I was going to ask about background checks, so you got me a little bit. But I want to ask a follow-up question. So if you are uh, – the volunteers are volunteering, but if you are assigned to Horizon and you're an officer, that means you have to go through a, back, a second background check? You go through – I think you go through one at initial employment, and then if you are assigned here, you have to go through a second one? Yes. There's the three. There's the three checks. Three checks. Regulations. Got it. Okay. Um, the I, I missed part of this. I'm sorry. I had to make it get on a call, but I, I, I wanted to follow up with some things we were talking about earlier on descriptions of jobs. Can you, can you tell me the job description for the YDS? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it's I, I could share that with you. It's actually a five-page document uh, that actually goes into yeah, details. But three I, bullet point. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that we actually understood under, uh, in conversation with our current JCs and our partners at 371, is that we needed to build a capacity of, of, of this staff to do two things, be able to set up limits, structure, and predictability in the day-to-day -day schedule of the young people that we serve, at the same time that actually have the ability to teach new skills. That's why it's called a youth development specialist. Thank you. So with that being said, there is a, I mean, you're today moving correction officers whose job is predominantly to provide safety and security into that role. And then they're being replaced with people who, by the description of it, have an entirely different purpose and role. It's hard to see the connection when you talk about uh, how, I mean, either, either one of two things is happening. You are moving people to provide security and safety to these facilities today to provide security and safety within their job title and then moving them out, so saying we don't need the safety and security anymore, and then you are replacing them with people who have a totally different job function, which sounds like a good group to have in, in this facility. So it's hard. I, I, I can understand the concerns. I'm not saying it's a legal argument. I don't make the legal argument, but I can understand the concerns that you're taking one entire job and, and, and another job and you are eventually replacing them. And they really ha have, it's by the job descriptions of what I know what the job description is and what I hear, entirely different roles. And it's hard to, I would, ma I would imagine it would be hard to believe that there's not a uh, going to be sort of an encroachment on the existing job. I mean, how do you, how do we, re I guess maybe I would just ask for maybe a further explanation how we explain how you're going to be move, switching these jobs or, or, you know, eventually trading, and yet the job title sounds so radically different from each other. So either we're sacrificing the safety and security, with, which is what the correction officers do, or we are asking folks to do something way out of their purview today. I mean, uh, I mean, safety and security is what we have always done in security detention before having a special security detention facilities. Our JCs did it really well, and they have always done it really well. The specialized juvenile, de spe the youth development specialist is actually grounded on what our juvenile counselors did. I'm not clear about the question of safety and security. We have very safe, very secure facilities. We have always had them. The data shows that actually they get safer every year. Um, what is the question regarding the YDS? Are the YDS? I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry that I have to. I have to. I've, I've used all my time. I think um, uh, YDS are, officers are providing security. Yeah, they provide safety and security in our crossroads facility. Okay. I mean, we, they, they do the day-to-day, -day, as I mentioned before. They provide predictability. They provide structure. They set up limits. 
Um, they but, they're, delete- but they're but they're not. But they're, they have a role that's beyond safety too. That sounds like by the job description. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and sorry, last question. The eighty five jobs that are going to be the ACS jobs there today. Is it is it all? What, what are the breakdown of those jobs? I can share that in writing. Um, as I mentioned before, a significant number of them are going to be program counselors embedded within each one of the living units. They're going to be case managers, which actually is a new role within the criminal adolescent parts, uh, criminal court, uh, you know, uh, guidance counselors. There's a significant number of different people that actually are doing what we intend to do, which is um, expand the programmatic elements to have young people engage and busy all the time. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for answering my questions. All right. Thank you. We're going to go to Council Member Holder who has a question. Yes. Just to follow up on uh, Councilman Powers' um, comments, the job description, as I see it, you're replacing correction officers eventually at Horizon with the YDS person. That Are there sub-job titles within that or... I mean, there must be, right? So, so there might be personnel to handle security. They're trained in only security and not counseling. Yeah, that's, that's not the way that actually the regulations are set up. That's not the way juvenile justice is done. So, I mean, you know, there's actually subtitles within the YDS series, and there's actually AYDSs and different levels of supervisors. But if you go to any facility in the nation, you will find actually at OCFS, you develop an AIDS or in New Jersey, they're called actually youth development counselors that are actually the folks that are actually doing safety and security and also helping young people improve their lives. It's not unusual. It's actually what is done everywhere. That, I, I guess to the layperson, we, we're trying to come to grips with the fact that corrections officers are going in mm-hmm. and being replaced with... What? What's the, you know, like a, a clear job description of, of the YDS. Of the, yes, of the YDS. Which we can share that with We you. haven't seen. We so, will. So, excuse we, me? We, I will share you the, you, you'll the share full it. set of tasks and standards. Because that, that would clear a lot of things up. Okay. Because correction officers, and I think the union is, is mentioning, they're asking, they're going in there blind, actually, uh, with their training, and it may not be sufficient to what you guys have planned for this facility but i understand their apprehension and and certainly the council members as you can, as you can hear mm-hmm. are concerned also thanks and thank you thank you council member we're going to turn it over to council member joe and i and thank you you have about four minutes sir do your thing thank you chairman i'll make it quick and just a follow-up to uh councilman holden's uh question there if we're going to be using existing correction officers which have been trained in a certain way and we're looking to actually change their common practice, have they been adequately trained to adapt to this new environment? So we believe so. We've, uh, we have a safe crisis management training that we've sent all the 300, 330 staff to so far. Um, A lot of the other trainings are specific to the state regulations. Um, Some of those are small procedural changes. Um, So we are on task to complete all this training by October 1st and believe that they are adequately equipped. You believe or you're certain because this is weeks away and if October 1st is to be the beginning of this new programming. I mean, let's make no mistake that this is a challenge for every agency to implement. Um, we are doing the best we can to put in a strong training curriculum to get our staff prepared. Isn't that a setup of failure if October 1st is the beginning and we're not certain here? M- many of these staff have been working with these kids for years. Um, so it's not, it's not radical in the, in the way uh, I think it's being characterized in that, in that last question. Elaborate a little bit more for me, and I'm just trying to grasp all of this. You, yeah. They've been... The system is broken. We came up with a solution to fix the system, but it's the same individuals that have been working in that system that are now going to be used to correct the problems. Is that what you're saying? Without the additional training? I mean, I, so unpacking that, the system as a whole, changing the, the raising the age, that's a system-wide change. Right specifically to our correction officers that have been working with adolescents for years and the many very positive reforms that we've had on Rikers over the last two years, 
you know, we, we think this is going to be a smooth transition and helping empower the officers also with the new training uh, will be a benefit and, and make this a success. But that new training is not confirmed. I, I'm, I'm sensing that we have not completed the new training. We, we will. You will. And the program is going to begin when? On October, I mean, prior to October 1st, we're going to start moving kids. And all of the mandatory trainings that we have to do for Raise the Age are just about complete or will be complete within the next day or two. I am excited to see what happens on October 1st. Thank you, Council Member. Um, and before we let this panel go, um, I just want to ask um, two quick questions. First one goes to the Department of Probation. It's been brought to my attention that the Department of Probation is hiring civilians to supervise probation officers in this transition. I wonder, is this correct? And how come there wasn't promotions within for supervisors? Um, we are currently hiring staff, as, as far as I know, and clearly that these are probation officers, and they're probation officers, so I don't know about the civilians. So, so this is where we won't resolve it today. Correct. But when you go back having the real conversation, because someone can't always be manipulating the truth. And when we stand before each other, we have our agendas we got to protect. And sometimes we got to sit here in a room and say, you know what, that is right. Even if it goes against my agenda or why I'm supposed to be testifying, yeah, that's, there's a blunder there, so let's fix it, as opposed to have, having plausible deniability because I don't know about it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So I say that to us all because clearly the committee is, has some real concerns with staffing and being able to kick this off adequately the right way not just saying oh we did it we got it done mm -hmm. but we didn't do it right because at the end of the day we got young people in the system who are going to get hurt if we mess it up as the adults in the room so I'm going to ask you if because everyone if you're taking training mm -hmm. and you're telling me I start my start my job in two weeks from now and I should be ready I have no warm-up no pre pre-run through before I walk in to try to save some kids life or even save my life at the same time so I'm just asking you, if you had more time, what would your program look like and would it be better than what you're delivering today? I would just like to add any, okay, fine. So I would just like to add, as far as any staff, whether it be probation officers or supervisors that are working with our young people, will have the fundamental training to do that. Whether it's in motivational interviewing, stages of training, restorative practices, they will have that. And therefore, we are committed to doing that because we take our young people very serious as well as their families. So just to add on to what you asked, anyone that's going to be working with us will be trained to do so. And I just wanted to make that statement. You got to, I, I, want, I want to hear from you, Nance. If you had more time, because we got, if we still got some possibilities in the last two weeks, what could, what could, but if the past next two weeks and a snowstorm hits and everything is shut down, October first is out the window. So, what does it look like if you had more time? If you had your choice and you had more time, what would your program look like? Yeah, I, I think I want to open up with some perspective. I mean, actually, uh, Commissioner Gray and I actually were in Albany about three weeks ago, and this is what I can say. New York City actually is the only jurisdiction that actually has submitted all the policies, and actually most of them have been approved verbatim. It's actually the only jurisdiction that actually has invested a significant amount of money, as I mentioned before, over $100 million to improve the facilities. On top of actually having to say, like Diana Kaplan said before, do two things. Be ready for the new race, the age kids, and take care of all the kids who were actually in Rikers. Um, whenever we go to any of these meetings, actually, and meet with other jurisdictions, People are at awe in terms of our ability to make all of these things happen so quickly. The ability to actually have, I mean, I think we open up talking about changes in the court process. Those are not minor things to do. The ability to actually have juvenile delinquents go to court until 1 a.m. is not just actually fair, just, and a big item. It's actually something that will reduce the likelihood of young people being in detention for one or two days when they don't pose a risk to the community. If you look at the population in Rikers, if you look at the population in detention today, a significant number of them, about 30% of them, live within four days. By actually having them in front of the judge, 
quickly, expeditiously in the middle of the night, I think we're making our system faster and fairer. And I think all of those things are things that we have to keep in consideration. The thing that is actually the most difficult to do in any transition, and I've done a few of them, is actually preparing the young people for the move and preparing the staff. And for the last two weeks, my staff and the staff of the Department of Corrections have been talking to young people, actually the Department of Education is part of those conversations, and to their families in getting them ready, even though we don't know some of them may not move, getting them ready to the transition to Horizons. And actually, we have to actually take pay, pay attention to details that actually no one knows about. The folks at the Department of Corrections who were working with young people for the last summer in actually painting murals in terms of what they expected in terms of doing with their life. Those murals are actually moving with them, with their staff and the officers to Horizons next week. Okay. Um, final question. And, and again, we know we know that the city, you've done some good things to put this together. You know, we the ball is rolling and you know and I just want to make sure by October 1st we all do want to make sure by October 1st that that wall is full and complete not 85 percent complete you know rather be a long distance runner for the long haul than a sprinter who sprints for the last six, six months and then falls apart when you just when you can't go any further so uh, but when it comes to close to home how how is your close to home program um, that's in effect right now. How is Raise the Age going to have an impact? If you can give me an answer in about two minutes. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that we have done really well, as you know, is that we have been able to reduce the number of kids in close to home significantly, almost 20% in the last two quarters. And that actually allows us to actually be at only about 60% capacity. So we actually have the capacity to take on the new 16-year-olds that will be coming in, in October. We're working, working very closely with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice with OMB and others to figure out what is the additional capacity that will be needed for close to home. And as soon as we know that, we will come here first because we will need the support of the council and we will have to develop new programs for close to home. Okay. Thank you. And Councilman John, I guess the last question. Just my, and I have to run for my own, my own committee. And who's providing the security today at Crossroads? It's a, it's a collaboration between special officers and our youth development specialist. So they're not correction officers currently? No. And they operate under different rules and circumstances than a correction officer would? The special officers? Yeah. I believe so. But I'm, but, yes. Well, isn't that, my, isn't that the concern that you're expecting the correction officers to come in and be fully trained and prepared to deal with this, um, this group? in a different manner that they've been trained and you've saying in the next you, in the next couple of days you expect or you hope and i would rather hear it's not perfect we're not ready but we're going to start and i'm not hearing that and i don't it's kind of misleading that you believe that on october 1st you're going to be ready for this tremendous tremendous shift and change mm -hmm. in using correction officers in a manner that which they're not prepared but on top of that you're existing where your existing security is operating under different circumstances so I I actually want to uh, go to the, the larger October 1st and just the raise the age deadline overall in mm -hmm. terms of you know we across raise the age is a system wide change it is obviously for the facilities but it's got a huge impact on the family court system, on probation, on the law department. Uh, it is, we absolutely have a very aggressive timeline for implementation. Agencies across the board have been working day and night to get this right and to be uh, as ready as we possibly can be for October 1st. Uh, and we have certainly indicated along the way that it has not been the easiest path because we are on a very short deadline because you know there's things that we've said that we would have liked the state regulations earlier things like that I, I with the timeline that we have we are trying to move mountains and we have the same consideration and concern about the well-being of these young people and the well-being of staff uh, in the facilities but also throughout the entire juvenile justice system and these new youth parts. So I am certain that come October 1st, we will be ready and that we will continue to approve after that. We are going to, there will be 
all of the young people will be moved off of Rikers. There will be a growing number of young people, 16-year-olds first, coming into the, the juvenile justice system. And we are going to continue to be working together with the agencies, with our other partners in labor, the district attorneys, the public defenders, nonprofit providers, to, to learn in those early days and make adjustments as we need to and be responsive. And so I don't want to say that we are going to have everything perfect by October 2nd. We are learning. We are going to uh, be continuing to do the hard work of implementation. Young people are going to be front and center. And so certainly, this is an aggressive timeline. I, we are going to be ready. We are prepared for it. And also, it will continue to improve. And we have to continue to do the hard work together of getting it perfect, because obviously, that is ultimately what we're responsible for. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. you, you, a couple of key words, which is our concern. I think everyone here is concerned for the same things. We hope to be ready. We moved mountains, mm -hmm. time, time constraints, mm -hmm. and then all under the notion of in the best interest and in putting our youth's health and safety as well as those that are working in that environment mm -hmm. and not jeopardizing any of their safety and health. Mm -hmm. That's pretty complicated. Mm -hmm. to say October 2nd, we may not get it right on October 1st, mm -hmm. uh, but moving forward, we're gonna try mm -hmm. to figure this out and improve. We're talking about the health mm -hmm. and safety mm -hmm. and life mm -hmm. of our most vulnerable children, as well as those that are here with the responsibilities of overseeing that. Mm -hmm. I would just hate the worst case scenario that a life is lost because we were not prepared. Mm -hmm. And whether it be a 16 or 17 year old or an administrator or a correction officer or some security or anyone else mm -hmm. that's going to be on someone's hands mm -hmm. yeah and i don't and i'm not feeling very comfortable and mm -hmm. confident that you're ready for this not this october or the way it sounds october 2nd or anytime in the near future thank you council member thank you for those words and he shared the sentiment at the committee and i think a lot of us in the room goes back to us hey if, October, if we need October 2nd, then let's utilize an October 2nd. Let's not be bullied from the state because the state said we want it on the 1st because at the end of the day, lives are at stake. So, again, we want to thank you all for, your, uh, for testifying and having this conversation. I'm asking you, please, we only got our mother 40 minutes in the room. Hang out. Listen to the other conversations. We might all learn something that can help improve what we're trying to accomplish on October 1st. Thank you again. Um, our next... Our next um, panelist consists of President Anthony Wells, Local 371, and President of COBA, um, Elias Osamadine. Please join. Yeah. Hey, we all in this. <laughs>
test that one too. Okay. Okay. Um, let's get started again. We are on limited time, so forgive me for those of you who came to testify. We're going to give you an opportunity. Um, I'm going to ask the presidents who are here. You have roughly three to four minutes to share what you want to share with us. Um, I'm asking everybody to be as concise as we can be um, so we can hit the nail on the head. So, again, um, thank you, gentlemen and ladies, um, for the, your day's conversation. And uh, you, whoever wants to start first, just introduce yourself for the record and go for it. Elias Hussam Dean, the president of the Correction Officers Union. I need to start out with a disclaimer. Uh, I'm not in uniform representing the department. Um, unfortunately, one of my members was murdered and I was at the funeral, so I didn't have time to change. So I'm not here representing the department, even though I wish I was. Um, j just <laughs> thank you. And, and just to start, I'm not even going to read this entire thing. I'm just going to go through it. Uh, I've always been unhappy that we get three minutes and the agency gets an hour to sit up here and lie or, or be disingenuous, if, if I can be politically correct. I think it's shameful that the DOC isn't here to represent the department. Uh, there are dozens of managers, uniform and non-uniform, that could have been here. We have nine chiefs of the agency, and there's no reason why they couldn't be here to represent. Um, I'm just going to jump around with my three minutes. Some of the things that I heard since I've been here, one of the things that I heard is that uh, the claim that we've been working with this population, and that's part of the reasons why uh, they want to use us at Horizon, and nothing can be further from the truth. Yes, we have worked with 16 and 17 year olds, but we worked with 16 and 17 year olds who were considered adults. So the rules that apply to adults are the same rules that apply to 16 and 17 year olds. So it's disingenuous of them to try to use that as a reason for why we should be uh, at Horizon. If that was the case, then why are we not at crossroads? Uh, the other thing is, uh, I needed to be clear that this uniform that I am wearing doesn't belong in Horizon, and we should not be in Horizon on October 1st or October 2nd. Uh, the other thing is, uh, the, the truth of the matter is, I was just there the day before yesterday, and this place is not ready. Yeah, they're doing double time. They're working their behinds off, but the place is not physically ready. Uh, the other thing is, is that in understanding the, the legislation or the bill signed by the governor as far as to raise the age is concerned, yes, historically, DOC has worked in conjunction with the juvenile justice, but it's never been correction offices. We've had on loan wardens, deputy wardens, chiefs of the agency to assist them and help them and guide them, but there's never been a time in the 30 years that I've been a correction officer, that correction officers have been anywhere near uh, this particular population. Uh, the other thing is, uh, and, and I think some of your people touched on it, is that, look, this, the, the fact of the matter is, the governor, they signed this bill in what, April, June of 2017, and the city of New York sat on their behind, and they did nothing. They did nothing, and they decided to involve us in April of this year, and all of a sudden now you want to sit here and claim that the five days of training that you're giving correction officer is going to, and all of a sudden, turn them into Tony Wells people. His people go to an academy and get extensive training to deal with 16 and 17 year olds. You're sticking us in our academy and you have our people giving us five days of some training and on, on October 1st, you want us to march into uh, Horizon as if we're some type of juvenile counselor. The reality is, would you send a police officer into a burning fire? No, you won't. You'd send a firefighter. Would you send a firefighter to fight crime? No, you won't. So why in the hell do you want to send this uniform into Horizon, someplace that's made for juveniles and adolescents, and try to turn us into something that we're not? The bottom line, uh, Councilman, is this is union busting. This is the city's way of union busting, trying to turn my members into something that we are not. Don't get me wrong. Would I love to have 300, 600 additional positions? How often does a union sit down and say, I don't want them? 
at the end of the day, this is not good for the 16 and 17 year olds, and it's damn sure not going to be good for my members. We want nothing to do with Horizon. And we're not saying it in, in, in a negative way. We're saying that if you really want to stick with the intent of what we believe the Raise the Age law or legislation was about, which is to take these kids off of Rikers Island and put them in an environment where they can flourish, where they can be taught, where they can be trained, and where they can be helped, then we don't see how that, how sending us there is going to do that. Um, Correctional officers, like I've been saying, and everybody that's been listening know, we're law enforcement officers. Sending us to Horizon on October 1st, and I, I mean, I heard people, I, I get so frustrated when I hear people say, I believe, I think, maybe, and that's all I heard from the ACS people up here. I think, maybe, listen, the bottom line is, they don't want to go to Horizon because they're afraid of these 16 and 17 year olds. That's the bottom line. They're afraid of them. They're afraid of the kids that they took a test, went to an academy, and graduated and said, this is who we want to help. Well, guess what? October 1st, send them to Horizon and let the youth development specialists and let the juvenile counselors and whoever else work for ACS that's running Crossroads run Horizon. I don't see the complication. I don't see where this is all that competent. Our complicated, our training does not, does not provide us with the type, our academy training does not provide us with the type of training that's needed to deal with these uh, 16 and 17 year olds. As a correction officer, I wear a slash proof vest. As a correction officer, I have chemical agent. As a correction officer, I have a baton. As a correction officer, I make arrests. As a correction officer, I use deadly physical force. As a correction officer, I transport inmates throughout the city and the state. That's not the job of a juvenile counselor. I am a peace officer. They are not. They're taught to hug and, 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 and communicate with these 16, 17 year olds. My job is to enforce the law. My job is to enforce the policies of the New York City Department of Corrections. You wanna send, look, they still don't even know whether or not we're going to be able to use chemical agents. So I, like I said to Mrs. Poole up in Albany, so basically what you're saying to my members is this, if one of the residents, inmates, detainees, adolescents, juveniles, whatever you all are calling them, if they actually, if I'm involved in a use of force with them, as it stands right now, where they are right now in RNDC, I can use spray. I can use my OC. Do you know what that does? That means that there's no physical injury to the inmate that I'm spraying, and there's no physical injury to my offices. So now you want me to go to Horizon without my equipment. When a New York City police officer walks into a New York City public school, do you people ask him to take his gun off? Do you ask him to remove his chemical agent? Do you ask him to remove his vest? You don't, but you wanna send me and my members to Horizon without our slash proof vest, without our chemical agent, without the things, the tools that we use to deal with adults. So I'm here. And, of course, we're in court. Yes, the judge uh, removed the TRO again because she's confused. I don't know if she actually knows the difference between a judge and, 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 and a paralegal because I would like to make her a paralegal. And maybe she'll understand exactly what our argument is. We are not juvenile counselors. We are not mental health workers. We are not social workers. We are law enforcement officers. We are the police of the jails. That's the test we took. Currently, uh, Councilman, they, are, they actually took pictures of my members, so we're going to have two ID cards. We're going to have an ACS ID card, and we're going to have a DOC ID card. Where does this happen? 
Where does this happen? So you have my members fill out this form that a juvenile counselor or a youth development specialist, they signed up for this. So they know they're going to be fingerprinted. They know that they're going to go through the justice center. They know they're going to have to deal with uh, uh, child registry and all this other type of stuff. That's not the job that I took. That's not the test that I took. I took a test to be a New York City correction officer. And I'm not interested in being a firefighter. I'm not interested in being a cop. I'm not interested in being a sanitation worker. I'm interested in being what I signed up for and the tests that I took. I can go on. I won't go on. The bottom line for me is we do not belong in Horizon no more than we are at Crossroads. You have the same inmates, 13 to 18 year old, same type of crimes, murder, attempted murder, rape, whatever it is. They're all in Brooklyn at Crossroads right now. Correction officers are not there. We're not pro providing security. We're not providing any type of service at Crossroads. And what do they have? About 25 kids. And as of October 1st, you're gonna get 50 from Rikers Island and you can't handle 50 kids? Didn't you take the test to do this? Didn't you say these are your jobs? This is union busted. This is the mayor and city hall, and unfortunately, some of your co-workers that's involving themselves in city and in, in, in union busting. And we're not interested. And I'm going, in conclusion, I'm going fighting, screaming, and kicking as of October 1st because I don't want my members to have anything to do with that because there's no positive outcome. And just one more thing, four years ago, they said we had fight clubs. Four years ago, they said we were abusing the 16 and 17 year olds. Four years ago, they accused us of dealing with Khalif Brower. Four years ago, the Department of Justice attached itself to a lawsuit, Nunez, four years ago. Four years later, these people are sitting here that we are the best equipped and we're the best qualified. Where, where's this hypocrisy coming from? This is hypocrisy. Can we handle 16 and 17 year olds? Yes, we can under our rules, under our guidelines, and under our training. Thank you. Thank you. Freddie, can I get some water? My name is Anthony Wells. I'm the president of the Social Service Employee Union Local 371. We represent the juvenile counselors, youth development specialists, and other personnel at Juvenile Justice. Uh, my brother uh, put it really, and in, in, he capitalized it. He don't want to be there. We don't want them there. Uh, I got angry this morning because the city is being disingenuous with you. They're there because this law says October 1st, New York City must be treated differently than anybody. This, this, all this other program stuff is nonsense. These 17-year-olds at Horizon will be treated differently than any other juvenile resident in the juvenile justice system because YDS personnel will not be there to provide counseling. My brother put it succinctly, he's a law enforcement officer. We're counselors. Our job is not just to provide security and safety, but to provide development. I'm upset with ACS and I've been as cooperative as I, as I can be. But I'm tired of hearing stuff for the first time at this table. I've asked them what programs are they bringing with them from corrections, now they're telling me this nonsense today. This is not a game. And I'm going to say something to you, and, and my brother's correct. The correction officers have been maligned, accused of all kinds of stuff over the last three or four years, and now you're saying they're so great that you need them. And you know, you want them at Horizon because you don't have any other choice. Be truthful. There's no cooperation between the state and the city. They can't even make a decision on a waiver. They've created a separate, the 17 years will be treated different than anyone else because they're going to be by themselves at Horizons. They're not going to get the counseling. They have created a disparate treatment that the advocates should really look at if you're really interested in how these young people are going to be treated. They're no longer going to be inmates, but they're going to be in a mini Rikers Island. If the DOC is housing and staffing primarily at Horizons, it's a mini Rikers. They're going to be responsible for outside patrol. Right now, at neither facility, we don't have outside patrols. Our facilities are not patrolled on the outside by anyone, but correction officers must do that because they're different. He's correct. They don't have OC and the SU and the safe crisis management doesn't work now for the little kids. 
We've told this agency that many times. We have members who have been brought up on charges and have been brought on felony charges when they've used this SCM. Because the Justice Center doesn't give a damn about the SCM. And these correctional officers are going to put their jobs in jeopardy more because their training, their philosophy, their thinking is different. And you're not account for that. And the real truth of it is, if there was better communication between the state and the city and our elected officials, they would have stopped this October 1st date. We brought this up. We've been together over almost, we're at the table because we made noise. We were not invited to the table. And yes, we negotiated the YDS title as we should be. We represent the Juvenile Council. It's a successor title. There's no favor here. We are the best equipped to deal with juveniles in the city of New York, we've been doing it for over 40 years. I haven't started in Spofford myself as a caseworker in 1980 when this was created. I'm glad to see it go. We All of us support the elimination of treating juveniles as adults. I don't care if we're the last two states or the first state. We all are in favor. But the way to do it, and, and they're disingenuous, if they had more time, what they should have said was, we wouldn't use correction officers if we had more time. We would have a program that really utilizes all the things Felipe is talking about. He's a wonderful man. He wants to do stuff with kids. That's great. But at the end of the day, we're going to put these residents at risk. We're going to put our staff at risk. There's a, you can't have a conjunctive policy together that have two different philosophies. When they merge ACS and juvenile justice, I opposed it five years ago because the focus is different. Juvenile justice is there to protect society from so-called bad little kids. And ACS and child welfare is there to protect little kids from bad grown folks. Two different philosophies, folks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the Bloomberg administration did it anyway, and I wasn't the president, by the way. I say that to you. Because mm -hmm. I would have been like Elias kicking and screaming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, you find my frustration now because we have tried our best to be most cooperative. But everybody here, I support this brother and what he's talking about. Because you are going to bring to a mix that don't belong. And you're doing it because the state and the city can't sit down at the table and put the political nonsense aside and say this is not the best interest for these kids and this is not the intent of the law. Why is New York being, being, being special? The waiver to commingle it, and she was incorrect about it. They could be commingled in the doctor's office and in school. Why wasn't New York granted a waiver? No, they have to request a waiver. That's political nonsense, okay? And it's time for other people, the advocates, your elected officials, to say, listen, guys, we need to get this right. The first time. The first time. Yeah, they, do they have a plan in place? Yes, they do. They're responsible people. The man made them make do it. They got a plan. They're going to put COs. I see mine. I ain't got you. I'm good at this. I start short. Don't worry about it. I was talking about Charles Isley. He hit people. I thought short. Sure. They have a plan. But is it the best plan? And the answer is no. And if they were to admit to you, they would tell you this is not the best plan because you know why? You're not using why. We said, why don't you put a YDS in a dorm, if you have the CEOs there, put a YDS with the CEO so that therefore there can be some counseling. And by the way, we're not replacing CEOs. This is our job. They are temporarily, and I say the word temporarily, standing in our place when they should not be. And they're only there because no one wants to talk about moving this October date, giving New York City an exemption to get it ready. By the way, New York City has different rules. Westchester, they're building trailers for these kids. We said, put them on the barge for a little while. They've been on the barge before. We've used the barge under juvenile justice. No, we can't. We're not doing that. That's the best answer. They don't complain. They go to the barge. It's a facility. It ain't the off-rikers. And then you can develop a real plan. But no, because the politics don't dictate that rationality becomes the center of this argument. It's bureaucratic adherence when we can change this stuff. So in closing, we're going to do what we have to do October first too. And the convention office is going to do what they have to do. And this brother leads his union well. I say to you all, you who claim to be, who care, you don't have to have our view of life. But you cannot tell me that this plan on October 1st is it, who, that me talking? That's Michelle. She's, she's a new grandmother. We give her a break today, okay? Congratulations. My brother, you got, we got time, my brother. We got time. But you know what, though? Okay, but you know, anyway, anyway, listen. Anyway, 
if you are concerned about what happens to these, these young people, then you need to raise your voice and say, this is not the plan, and we need to push back this day. Okay? I wasn't planning on speaking today, and, and uh, but I just heard some things that just continues to um, disturb me. I'm Dalvin E. Powell, president of the United Probation Officers Association, and one thing I want to definitely highlight because I do wear the hat of a social, I got this. You got one minute. Mr. One minute. President. Probation officers provide community supervision and, and, and we also provide supervision um, with corrections. Um, that the focus on the children is totally lost in this whole thing. And I thought it was supposed to start off as the children. And the response to the department using the raise the age as an opportunity to bring civilians to um, supervise probation officers is definitely and absolutely disturbing because now they're taking the opportunity to do something totally against what they should be doing. They're risking public safety. They've, yes, hired provisionally 18 probation officers to, to become supervisors, but they're insisting on, and they already have hired definitely three civilians to supervise probation officers, thereby overriding DCASs qualifications to become a to become a supervised probation officer they have actually um, defied the rules and regulations of the state h10 rules and regulations to become a supervised probation officer and I find it's very very disturbing these are not peace officers we are peace officers law enforcement we are we are qualified and we are trained and I just cannot understand and and in the defense of um, deputy commissioner uh, Ms. gray she probably did not know because olr did not know so we got some serious issues that needs to be addressed. Okay, thank you. I want to thank this panel. I'm not going to ask any questions because you laid it out. You laid it out for what it is. I'm going to ask the administration. You're still in the room. I'm going to ask you to figure out in the next 48 to 72 hours. Sit down with both of them because they make valid points. Everyone's hearing it. Um, I don't know who on your end who is not hearing it, but everyone in the room is hearing their frustration, but the real talk that they're having. So we got to make sure that we get it right the first time. And if October 1st does not make sense, then let's have the adult conversation to figure out how do we save the program and, more importantly, save the lives of our young people who will be transitioning in. And so, I only had one meeting with the department. That's it. Okay. Chairman Thank King, I just yes. want to make a quick point. Sure. It's very quick. My name is Frederick Fusco. I am the legislative chairman for the COBA. When you look at who they're hiring, who they're bringing over to Horizon, rather, a lot of these officers have two years on the job. One of the criteria was to work with children for two, uh, two, I'm sorry, with the juveniles for two years. These guys working with the 16, 17 year olds came from the academy, went right over to RNDC and they worked with juveniles. So out of those two years and that two year criteria, six months of those two years, our academy-based training through the New York City Department of Correction. That includes deadly physical force, yeah. use of force, Article 3530, mm. Penal Law 2.30. Now, not even a little bit more than two years later, we're going to give them five days of training and say, we want you to handle everything else differently. Yeah. That's all I have to say, sir. Not thank fair. You. You're absolutely correct. I want to thank you, and it's on the record. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, we're going to move on um, to bring a number of of our advocates who are here today. Um, Kate Rubin, Kate Rubin, yeah. Lisa Freeman, and Nancy Ginsburg. Julia Davis. Vidal Guzman. In the office. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Um, whoever's going to go first, um, thank you. Uh, you know, I know sometimes these hearings can go a little off and we got to listen, but the people who are delivering on the service, we need to get real concrete answers for them so we can hold them accountable when they say the right thing or if they don't say the right thing. So it's up to you all as advocates to keep the, keep them to the fire. So whoever's going to start. Vidal, you want to start? Yeah, yeah. My name is Vidal Guzman. I'm the community organizer for the Close Rikers campaign. I'm also the survivor of the program. Um, the program wasn't started four or five years ago. I have 2007 in my 
on my arm. Actually, the day that I was incarcerated in Rikers Island, the program been around for around 13 years. Um, so whatever the DOC is actually saying is not true. It's, it wasn't just something that just happened. Um, so I want to really be the real question uh, really becomes what happened if DOC become the caretakers of the youth. Um, and I, the DOC has created the culture of the program and of Rikers Island. As you know, the DOC don't want or thinks of being a part of this process. It's time for us as a city, as a whole, to step up and say DOC should not look over our youth. They are gonna be, they're going to be in Crossroad and Horizon. It's time for us to step up for our community, especially our community that we're serving, that to end the culture, to make sure that the youth are in spaces that are rehabilitated and restorative justice. I'm not done. People tonight will be heading home to go, to, uh, to go home. Ladies going home to very comfortable homes where they could relax easily, secure, and be proud of the community. Other families of, in, of youth that are incarcerated will return back to underfunded, over-incarcerated, over-policed communities to, will be returning to their uncomfortable communities also in fear that DOC will be become their caretakers. It's time for us as a city to understand what that actually means and don't let them believe that the, the program was started four years ago because that program was around for around 12 to 13 years. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, thanks, Chair and members, for holding the, um, the hearing. I'm Kate Rubin, Director of Policy at Youth Represent. I have one minute, so I'm going to summarize into two things. I think there are a lot of reasons to be hopeful about Raise the Age, and I think there are a lot of reasons to be vigilant. We urge the council to move quickly to pass a data reporting bill. In my written testimony, I have a long list, a pretty detailed list. We would love to meet with you and talk with you about it in more detail. I won't summarize it here for the sake of time, um, but we think getting that passed sooner than later, since the law is about to go into effect, would be is imperative. Um, and then the second is we wish to reiterate our opposition, which we have as stated many, many times, uh, to the city's plan to, spa to staff Horizon with DOC correction officers. Um, COBA has made clear their vehement opposition and whatever happens with the litigation, one thing is certain, 16 and 17 year olds will not be well served by correction officers trained in and accustomed to an adult correctional environment transferred against their will to Horizon. The 16 and 17 year olds we work with at Rikers are apprehensive and fearful about the transition because of the staffing issue. Um, so we look forward to continuing to work with you. Good morning. My name is Lisa Freeman. I'm from the Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Practice. I'm here with Nancy Ginsburg, who's the director of our adolescent practice um, in criminal court. We represent the kids in both the adult and the juvenile system in New York City, and we are strong advocates for Raise the Age. We also oppose DOC's presence at Horizons, but we fully and vigorously support Raise the Age, and we do not want to see it delayed. We think it's frankly overdue, and we don't think that there's a justification for delay at this point. Um, we think that the council has a pivotal role in overseeing implementation, and we think that the essential things to be looking for down the road are that the youth are not being penalized once they've been moved under Raise the Age in any way, shape, or form, either through the criminal process the juvenile process or in the facilities themselves. Um, but we think it, this reform is overdue and we don't think that it should be delayed and we don't think that the culture of Rikers Island should be a justification for delay. So what needs to happen is reform on Rikers Island. As you know, we're counsel in the Nunez lit litigation. Reform needs to happen on Rikers Island and reform needs to happen in the juvenile justice system. And the, the, um, the correction union and the uh, the, the attachment to that culture of brutality should not be a justification for delaying this essential reform. Hi, I'm Julia Davis with Children's Defense Fund. I want to reiterate that we've heard about some enormous progress that the city has made. I want to just highlight that for a moment. We've seen enormous decreases in the number of young people on Rikers, the number of young people in our juvenile system. We've heard a lot about the planning and preparation here. I think it's critical that as you move ahead, you have a data bill, you have a way to evaluate, 
and look at what's happening inside the facilities. So we make sure as we implement this law, we're able to course correct as we go. My testimony also outlines some very specific areas that we want to be looking at, including incidents in the facilities, response to those incidents, how long young people are in those settings, and what happens to them while they're there. And that includes all the settings that we're talking about and the older kids going into the existing settings. I think that as you uh, continue to watch what's happening here, it's important to note that the impact of correction officers is something that we are all sensitive to. What we've seen in terms of the litigation shows that we cannot continue along this course for the long term. We must have a solution before 18 months with regards to staffing with the YDS staff in these facilities. We cannot continue to be in this limbo land not knowing exactly what will happen. So we need to see that resolved and we need to see a faster pace to the appropriate staff being in these settings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. I appreciate you much. Um, and our final panel consists is of Carrie Lowe and Ashley. Ashley, Ashley, I don't know what you wrote here. Ashley, Ashley's in the house. Ashley Super, Sawyer, Sawyer. Sawyer. There we go. There's two. No, that's it. This is that's it. This is the last panel. Um, and Exalt, who's in the room? Is Exalt still here? Who's representing Exalt today? Is it Dominique Perry? Um, yes, we're still here in the room. We have if you have one of your young people, um, ask them to come join us for the final panel. <coughs> Dionysia? Anisha, where is she? She's coming. Okay. This is our last panel of today's committee hearing. Um, please introduce yourself for the record, and um, we'll start right with Miss uh, Sawyer. Uh, good afternoon now. I will, you have my written testimony and I will refer to it. Our written testimony, well first let me just introduce myself. My name is Ashley Sawyer. I'm an attorney and I'm also the Director of Policy and Government at Girls for Gender Equity. Um, and our focus is on supporting young people, particularly cis and trans girls of color and gender non-conforming young people. In addition to that, I had experience as an attorney representing young people while I was at Youth Represent who were incarcerated on Rikers Island, ages 16 to 24. I saw firsthand, I was in their housing units, um, and I saw firsthand some of the, the brutality that they experienced while there, and I'm happy to speak offline more about that. Um, what I, in my testimony, the written testimony, you'll see that we are fully in support of any efforts to to address the sentencing of young people who were already sentenced prior to Raise the Age was be being implemented. But in reference to today's comments, we just want to emphasize the ways that girls in particular and young people are harmed by having the same Rikers culture replicated in juvenile facilities. Girls and Rikers, we I'm sure you saw the investigative reporting that was recently released about the rate of, ra of rape and sexual assault at Rosie's. GGE is a leader in the conversation around sexual assault. We're the home of the Me Too movement. And we want to make sure that young people who have been affected by the criminal legal system or the juvenile legal system are not forgotten in our responses to sexual assault and gender-based violence. It is incredibly important that anyone staffing a facility with young people has the training and the skill and the care to appropriately respond to young people who have experienced sexual trauma in their past and are keeping young people safe. We understand that juvenile facilities, period, are not safe, place for young, safe places for young people, but that becomes even more exacerbated when you bring the culture from Rikers to a juvenile facility, <coughs> and it puts our young people at great harm. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. I know we're on a time limit, so um, I would just like to share my testimony. Hello, members of the New York City Council, Chairman King. Thank you for the opportunity to, for me to testify today. My name is Dominique Perry. When I was 13, my mom kicked me out, and I had to adapt to New York and survive. 
I grew up in foster care. I had no idea what foster care was, so I would follow what everyone else would do, not knowing that it would lead me into some serious trouble and I would have to deal with the consequences. At 16, I was introduced to Rikers facility and Horizon Juvenile Detention Center. I felt like I had no one in my corner or on my side. No one really wanted to hear any excuses for my behavior whatsoever under any circumstances, especially the fact that I was in foster care. So I sucked it up and I did whatever I was told to do and I had to do. As I'm sharing these traumatic details with you all today, I'm not looking for any sympathy or any tears, but because of this, it raised the age was in effect around the time that I grew up and I honestly would have dealt with life differently. But that's my past and today we are in the present. I think that raising the age is very important so that no young people have to experience what I've been through. It's not fair to be young and end up in high risk places. When you're young, you are still growing and need proper guidance and high risk facilities are ruining the chances for young people to succeed. A big reason I was successful is that when I was on probation, I was able to get help from a program that gave me education and an internship. I did so well at the internship that I was offered an additional chance to stay after my time was done. I think that's very important for youth like me because finding jobs can be very stressful. I was introduced to a program called Exalt Youth in 2013, and man, did they change my life. Exalt believed in me from the very first day and seen something in me that I did not. Um, the superstar. I remember my first, my teacher from the program sat me down one day and asked me what was going on, and I was afraid to open up because I felt embarrassed and sometimes afraid that I'll be judged. Let's not forget the fact that Exalt Youth is a judge-free zone and I could be myself as a lesbian around them. Exalt has helped me in so many ways. They became my family in short timing, and that means a lot to me because when I was young, I would never ever put my trust into anyone. I would stay there late most days and do homework and receive support with my job. Employment. Let's not forget the fact that Exalt provides metro cards and placement with paid internships that would typically lead to permanent employment. Exalt also teaches the youth about body language, code switching, and dressing appropriate for job inter interviews and anything else that you can name. I honestly do not know what I would do without them. Now, at the age of 21, today, I'm in college full time. I'm passing off my classes. I'm working two jobs, and I'll be mentoring young girls who are on probation because that's something that I truly believe in, and that's my passion. Everything that I know up to today is because of Exalt Youth, and they can have my heart any day due to the fact that they were complete strangers, and they helped me find myself again. To this very day, when I go to visit Exalt, I feel like a completely new person in a good way. I hope the city council will do everything that you guys can to make sure that youth like me get to have programs that will help them succeed in every way possible. Thank you all for taking your time out to listen to my testimony, and it truly means a lot to me. Um, on the behalf of uh, Friends of Island Academy, I want to thank the Committee of Juvenile Justice for the opportunity to address you. Uh, my name is Kerry Lowe, and I'm here representing Friends of Island Academy. Um, originally, I was a youth member at Friends, and now I'm a, a full-time staff member. Um, Friends is a nonprofit organization um, found on the school floors of Rikers. Uh, at the time, you know, the city held about 23,000 people per night on Rikers, uh, which 35,000 were the um, young people between the ages 16 to 18. I was arrested and sent to Rikers a half a year ago. Um, there I was trying to just think of a thousand ways, you know, just to get out of jail and um, change my life. And um, I met an advocate there named Kevin. Uh, we were in a housing area where he introduced me um, and was telling me about friends. Um, they started asking me questions about my life, you know, my family, my future goals, um, something that no one else really had done. Um, he came back you know, again and again, and uh, gave me his card and told me, you know, keep in touch with him when I got out of prison. A few weeks later, I was released, found Kevin's card, and um, was just trying to get a job. And he was coming to my court dates and just became someone, you know, I could talk to. Um, my second court date, you know, he introduced me to Max. He's a mediation specialist for friends. Uh, he was there to advocate for me in court, and it felt like perfect timing because um, on that day of court, I was told that I would have to take three years, and I just lost it. Um, I was on the verge of you know just arguing with my lawyer until Max stepped in and cooled me down, mitigating the situation. Um, soon after, I started coming to Friends site in Harlem, uh, and I met Aaron, Gina, Messiah, and the list goes on. The people who just been there supporting me along the way. Um, for me, it made me really feel like I belong. Uh, growing up in Harlem, I didn't really have much of a family. 
uh, connecting with Kevin and Max, it opened up just a whole new network of people who were there to support me and what I needed. Uh, since I first met Kevin, I had started a full-time job here at Friends, and I've been able to provide for my family. I have started college uh, this fall, and um, I'm majoring in sociology. When kids leave in custody have no plans or assistance for discharge, uh, both personal development and public safety, you know, just compromise. Youth require safe and secure housing, school assistance, health, mental health care, fundamental life skills, and a sense of belonging opportunity to achieve and engage. Over the last two years with New York City funds, we have been able to uh, scale our model through what is called Youth Reentry Network. The network is a uh, com compromise system, well, is a system of, um, it's developed just for aftercare, you know, uh, focused initially on those who 16 and 17 years old, was triggered by youth admissions to Rikers. The network is compromise system and take house, housing, um, discharge planning, reentry support, um, which belongs with youth and young adults 16 to 21 admitted to Rikers. And it's basically how they met me while I was in Rikers. Um, since the network started friends, youth advocates, people like Kevin, have engaged in over 2,500 young people ages 16 to 21. And of those, 1,020, 16, and 17 year olds. So for the most part, it's just people like me, you know, young. Uh, of those we engage in custody, uh, 1,927 young people have been released, in which 821 are 16 to 17 year olds. Um, I would not be sitting in front of you today testifying at the city council hearing if it wasn't for people who believed in me. I would not be in college if it wasn't for those people, those advocates, those counselors who believed in me. I would not have a full-time job if it wasn't for those people who believed in me. If the system is going to change and ways for you know things to just work for kids who are 16 and 17, they have to make sure that every single kid has an advocate, has a counselor, has someone there while they're at Horizons and Crossroads that they can go to and talk to. We really appreciate your testimony. It's powerful, and we want to thank you. Um, we ran out of time on us. There's another committee standing in the hallway to take into the room. So I want to hear from you quickly um, and share a few words with us before we close. Um, my name is Denasia Latine Finch. Hello, all members of city council, chairman, and guests. Um, I'm here today to share my story and my testimony. I'm going to keep it short uh, and brief. Um, my fight for a raise the age goes deeper than just the legislation, but determines the future of our next generation. It has been my honor to be fighting for the freedom and rights of teenagers of New York City for the last two years, though people have been working on this reform for over two decades. Um, during my lifetime in New York City, I was arrested constantly between 13 and 16, um, where I was beaten by officers at age 13 and was sent to Rikers at age 15, going on to my 16th birthday. Um, being incarcerated has its effects on people causing trauma, PTSD, anxiety, and even depression. These are lifelong lasting conditions causing people to harm themselves or others and then continuing the cycle of incarceration. Um, we must all work together collectively as a community to keep our kids home. Um, given everyone has, making, has made mistakes, most kids are arrested for minor crimes such as jump, jumping in the turnstile, fighting, or simply being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, I, uh, after my arrest, I was put on probation for a year and then it was extended and I was given a, a mandatory six month proba probation with cases. And after that, I was referred to a more hands on program called Exalt. And I stuck with the program because of the curriculum and the experience I gained in the internship. Exalt opened opportunities to me that I probably wouldn't have wouldn't have been available to me. They opened a new lane to the road I was driving down. And after Exalt, I have enrolled into a new school, successfully completed high school, gotten scholarships for the work that I have done, and um, I have been featured in the Huffington Post. And I ha and I have been able to explore different career options. My journey after my incarceration has begun, and I'm work and I'm looking forward to continuing life, um, studying liberal arts, advocating, advocating for youth, and continuing to support raise the age programs like Exalt work and benefit youth because it is engaging, educational, and most of all, ins inspirational. Thank you to thank you to all of you who support organizations such as Exalt Cases and Fortune Society. 
who sh you should continue to support these organizations in their efforts to create restorative justice. You should continue to, to support kids of the future. You should continue to support our youth and all they have to offer the world. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you all for joining us for today's committee hearing. Um, We've heard a lot of conversation today, and I'm going to say to the administration, the unions, we got to figure out how to get this right the first time. And if October 1st has to turn to October 2nd, and as I've learned and did some reading, that if we need to comply with October 1st to get people off of Rikers, I was told there was a bar, it's called Vernon C. Bain, that can possibly be used just so we can be in compliance and getting our students off of Rikers. So if that's the case, that's another alternative because we got to make sure the system that we put in place is a system that's actually going to deliver what the Rage to Age wants to deliver for our children. So thank you, everybody, for participating, looking for us, and continuing this conversation to getting it right in two weeks. Thank you again. This is adjourned. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.